Okay, great. Welcome everybody. Sorry for a few little technical glitches with what we were hoping to be screen sharing for our opening slide. Um, but we are happy to welcome you all to our Orca Salmon Month um, virtual event. We're really excited to have a great um, group of presentations and videos for you tonight. Some are live, some are videos. Um, we um, will start with um, just thanking everyone for having an interest in orcas and salmon and for acknowledging that we're all in Coast Salish lands and waters, the Salish Sea that we are so lucky to be uh, to habit, be a ha inhabitants in along with the orcas and salmon and all the tribes who are helping to, to care for those precious resources. Um, and we just value their their historical and ancestral knowledge and all of the work that they do for these species that we care so much about um, and always do our best to, to partner and work with many of the tribes around the Salish Sea and um, are happy tonight to have Willie Frank and David Trout from Nisqually who will be speaking later. Um, and we have um, Jacques White from the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project to talk about what happened to salmon out in the ocean. Um, we will have a uh, video from Brad Hansen from NOAA Fisheries about some of the research they have done on Southern resident orca prey um, and what, what salmon resources are um, important to them. Um, his is on video because he's out um, on the Bell Shimada research boat right now trying to get more research. Um, we are also very happy to have Tara Galuska um, to talk about the importance of fall um, Puget Sound salmon runs. She is the orca recovery uh, manager for Washington State. Um, she also spoke at our um, Orca Month kickoff event, or maybe it was the, the end of the month event, um, or both that she spoke at. So, um, and David and Willie also spoke at our um, Orca Month Orca Salmon Culture event. So we're really um, pleased to have all of them back. Um, and then at the end um, of the evening, we have two incredible videos, one from the Center for Whale Research of Southern resident orcas um, drone video showing them um, chasing salmon and prey sharing. And then from Florian Groner, um, some amazing footage of the Elwha and the different salmon um, and trout species in the Elwha and of Southern resident orcas. Um, so um, we're saving the, the fun, um, really cool visual stuff for the end. Um, and just really excited to have amazing um, speakers and information for you this evening. So we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules um, and to celebrate Orca Salmon Month with us. Um, this is a month we, we celebrate it um, because for us who live down in Puget Sound, uh, it's when the Southern residents come down into our area and we have a better chance of seeing them. Um, so it also just brings to mind the importance of the fall Puget Sound salmon runs to the Southern residents, especially in these days when they aren't using the habitats, um, their historical uh, core habitats off the San Juans as much um, in the past several years. Um, so they have been still coming down into Puget Sound. Um, they are headed, they were headed down Boundary Pass um, mm -hmm. a while ago. Are they, <laughs> if Cindy just disappears, we'll know they're off San Juan Island. <laughs> this was daylight, we'd lose Cindy when they show it's, it's up around Henry Island. No doubt. <laughs> she may be gone. No, <laughs> but um, anyway, we, we hope they will come into Puget Sound. We'll all get a chance to see them. 
But until then, we'll learn about why they're here. And we will start um, with Brad Hansen um, and his presentation about Southern resident diet and prey availability and unraveling um, what the Southern resident orcas eat um, and its contribution to assessing um, their health. Uh, let me get my screen share started and hope this works better than it did earlier. There we go. Thanks everyone at Orca Network for the invitation today to talk about uh, Southern Resident Killer Whale diet and prey availability and the work that we've been doing to try to unravel what the whales eat and uh, how this is contributing to uh, assessing prey availability um, <clears throat> for the whales. I just wanted to acknowledge that we have a lot of people that have been working with us over the years, and this is a, a not a completely exhaustive list, and so I apologize to anybody in advance if I have left their name off. But um, uh, I think that the main point I want to make is that, that the work that I'm presenting is um, it, it could not have been done without a whole large team of people. So one of the things I wanted to stress is that um, the recovery plan for southern resident killer whales uh, is required to identify a number of risk factors. And I tend to take a very prey-centric view of the risk factors and when we, when we talk about the importance of prey. And while the first risk factor listed is prey availability, and that we tend to think in terms of numbers of fish of various species and stock, um, we're also concerned about decreases in run sizes within the seasonal ranges as well as decreases of, due to potential competition from other salmon predators, an example being northern resident killer whales. But it's also vessel disturbance, which is essentially access to prey. And so we're concerned about prey noise, about vessel noise and presence and how that reduces the ability of the whales to potentially detect and catch prey. And then finally, um, the third um, uh, risk factor was contaminant burdens. And this is really a prey quality issue. And it's really essentially a, 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 a related to the biomagnification of contaminant burdens in the prey. And then secondly, there's also concern about uh, decreasing, the decreasing trend in adult fish size of a given age. And so um, when we sort of add all this up, the concerns we have is that fewer play plus reduced access plus smaller prey size equals fewer calories per unit effort, and i.e. that's essentially reduced net caloric intake, and that this reduced net caloric intake will lead to malnutrition, and when you add in contaminants, i.e. tox, this decreases immunocompetence and in turn increases disease susceptibility, and this increased disease susceptibility uh, increases mortality rate. So that's sort of the overall um, way that we're trying to put this in context. So I wanted to start with a little bit of background on previous studies of Southern Resident Killer Whale Diet. And this really goes back to sort of the foundational work on <clears throat> photo ID in that um, the work of uh, Mike Big and Ken Balcom um, were primarily just anecdotal observations. Uh, they were limited in number, but salmon appeared to be the primary prey that were being observed. And this photo to the right taken by Astrid a number of years ago is, is actually quite a rare sight. I remember talking to Astrid the day that she took that, and I made some comment about uh, been trying to take a photo like that for five years, and her comment was she'd been trying to take one like this for 20. So it's, um, you know, the, despite the fact that the whales are, you know, regularly eating salmon, um, they've been keeping it sort of hid from us. The, the second approach to looking at diet was through uh, salmon catch data and whale presence. And this was inferential and it was sort of this guilt by association, which, um, you know, was not necessarily a really viable approach. And, and Jim Heimlich Baran had, had published on this back in the, the late 80s. And then finally, the first paper that really sort of 
got at um, the direct, got that at this directly was uh, John Ford's work in 1998 and his his uh, colleagues and they looked at stomach contents and were sampling uh, prey events at the surface. And that work that John and his colleagues did was a compilation of stomach contents and predation events over a 25 year period from 1973 to 1998. And one of the things that uh, was of particular interest was of the five stomachs they got, they had had a number of Chinook bones and flesh that were in those. And, but they only had 28 total Southern resident killer whale fish predation observations. Um, but having said that, uh, Chinook were, did appear to be a primary, uh, of primary importance, and, but there were 14 different Salmonids ID the species. So this was sort of the first indication that Chinook were a preferred prey item, but they did have a relatively small sample size. And when you think about 28 samples collected over a 25 year period. So um, we were concerned about that particular aspect of things um, that in terms of concluding that Southern residents were a Chinook specialist based on a relatively small data size, sample. So what we did was uh, beginning in 2004 during the summer months, we initiated uh, basically a, a focal follow behavioral foraging study up in the San Juan Islands and uh, in their primary suburb habitat at the time. So one of the things we were interested in first of all collecting was what does foraging look like in order to better describe what foraging behavior actually was. And we did this by looking for and classifying behavioral changes such as changes in speed and direction, associations with other whales, dive durations, uh, those types of things. And um, as far as actual addressing the diet itself, we did much like John Ford had done. We collected prey re uh, remains from predation event samples, which included both um, scales and tissue um, in order to be able to take a look at um, you know what the, what the actual species were that they were collecting and then the primary objective of this was to obtain a contemporary sample size that was sufficient to accurately determine the uh, prey preferences for the whales so one of the things we noticed during our follows was that the whales were converging quite a bit and likely prey sharing and, uh, and this was actually uh, reported by uh, Ford and Ellis in 2006 for, for northern resident whales. We had, we had started seeing this our first field season in 2004 and then uh, John and Graham had collected a lot of, of data up, in the north, up with the northern resident community that basically confirmed what we had seen. But one of the things that we um, tumbled onto by spending time behind the whales was that there were other things in those fluke prints. Um, so the, the prey sharing not only allowed for collection of scales, but also collection of tissue. And so we started collecting that. And then there were other things, um, feces, uh, mucus, uh, regurgitations, all of these types of materials were also uh, being found by us in the, essentially the wake of the whales. So fortunately at the Northwest Fishery Science Center, we have a very active uh, molecular genetics program. And so we were able to use, utilize the tools in that department to um, work on species, prey species identification from these particular materials. And so the <clears throat> first work that we summarized was in a 2010 paper that I have the citation for here. Um, that looked at summer diet. And this was a combination of data that we collected in the San Juan Islands and our colleagues at the uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada had collected out uh, in the uh, western entrance of the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And so what we found here over the course of the spring and summer was um, a lot of Chinook primarily in June, July, August, and September, but there were some other salmonids mixed in. Uh, about greater than 80% um, were Chinook, um, as I noted. The main thing that we noticed though was that there were very few sockeye and essentially no pink salmon in any of these samples. 
as and as well, we only had one uh, non salmodid show up in, the, in this particular sample. So one of the questions that we posed though was, so we have all this Chinook, the question is where were these Chinook from? And the very first indication we had was from our 2004 and five field seasons that Chinook were important. So I asked the folks in the molecular genetics group, I said, so can you tell us where these Chinook that we're getting samples from are coming from? And um, they said, well, and this was in 2005 that I asked the question. They said, no, give us a few months. We got a paper coming out and we're basically developing a coastwide library for the DNA of Chinook. And so this um, GAPS um, system, as they call it, was basically, they took over 20,000 individuals from 166 different populations across 41 regions from the Gulf of Alaska to central to the Central Valley of California and essentially created, created a library of DNA to which we could compare the DNA that we were collecting from the scale and tissue samples. And so when we looked at this, what we found was that um, in the spring, it was kind of a mixed bag. And that, and if you recall back to the previous slide or so that I showed there, we didn't have a very big sample size in May. And uh, so there was a mixture of Fraser River and Puget Sound fish there. But uh, when we looked at June, you can see very clearly that the upper Fraser River uh, basin is very important in June. And then that transitions to the middle Fraser in July. And then by August, it's the South Thompson. And then finally, the lower Fraser River. So basically, almost all of the major watersheds in the Fraser River are seasonally important to southern resident killer whales. Well, then the question was, we could get, uh, from the feces, we could get uh, prey DNA, but um, the, the question was, what, you know, what was the, what, what did the diet look like from this? We went through a number of different iterations over the course of about six years uh, and finally settled on this uh, next generation sequencing um, process. I mean, it, one of the, the exciting things about genetics is it's in a rapidly expanding field, but the bad news is that uh, if you um, basically stop for six or eight months to look at the data that you're, you just got analyzed, there's probably a new piece of equipment that came out in the last year that you that can do it better, cheaper, and faster. And that's sort of what we ran into. But the bottom line was we were able to get an out, the output from this system of the percent of DNA of various prey species in a fecal sample. So we were essentially getting the proportional contribution of these different prey items in the diet. And the, the advantage of that is, is that rather than just sampling a particular predation event, we're essentially allowing the uh, gut and um, intestinal system, if you will, to um, essentially act as, as a mixing platform to homogenize the sample to give us um, the, uh, you know, the, the, what it's integrating over several meals, essentially, to give us maybe a broader picture of what their diet was uh, in, the, in the not too distant past. And so in, um, in 2016, Mike Ford, a uh, senior author paper that basically did a comparison between the diet that we got from scales and tissues versus the diet we got from DNA. And what we found was that, in fact, just like with the scale sampling, salmonids made up 98% of the, of the diet. And Chinook uh, was the most common at about 80%, which is very similar to what we saw with the scales and tissue. Um, we also found uh, by incorporating some additional samples from, um, particularly from September, that we were seeing coho start to show up. And, um, and then by midsummer, we were also seeing uh, sockeye actually showed up in some um, higher concentrations than what, we, than what we had seen with the scale samples, where we essentially had seen none. Um, so the bottom line was that the using feces essentially allowed us to, to get a, uh, to demonstrate that the, the diet of the whales during the summer was perhaps broader than what we'd expected based on just scales and tissues alone. 
So the, one of the big underlying questions though is, you know, where do the whales spend uh, their time during the year? And this is uh, a plot that I generated a number of years ago um, from essentially using data from 2003 to 2009 that shows where the whales were uh, essentially spending their time. And a lot of that in the summer, of course, was in the San Juan Islands, and that has recently changed. So some of the information I'm presenting here is, a, uh, is I wouldn't call it outdated, but it's, um, it's changing, let's just put it that way. Uh, but what you can see here is they're spending a lot of time outside uh, Puget Sound and that, uh, or outside the San Juan Islands. In the fall, they do spend some time in Puget Sound but the outer coast is uh, one of the primary destinations in the uh, fall and winter months. So, um, and this just shows, um, this is from Donna Hauser's 2006 master thesis. It does show that the whales are in fact, when, when they're in in the summer, uh, these are three different pods and the three different panels here, J's, K's and L's. A lot of time is typically spent on the west side of Harrow Strait. Some more recent work um, by uh, our colleagues at DFO, um, and this just is a, uh, is a report that came out from Sheila Thornton's group here recently, shows that um, the occurrence patterns, while the west side of San Juan Island continues to be a area that's um, used a fair bit, uh, they have incorporated additional data that um, also show that the area up off of uh, uh, the Fraser River mouth uh, is an area of importance for the whales to spend time. And probably more uh, interestingly was just that uh, this area out at the west entrance uh, is a place that the whales are spending a lot of time. And this is primarily in the Swiftsure Bank area. So, you know, getting back to this particular plot, um, I just wanted to emphasize that, you know, that outer coast area does appear to be of importance not only during some of these other seasons but also during the the summer months and but I wanted to um, talk a little bit about uh, where what we were finding in terms of these other areas and so um, as a lot of you are probably aware uh, the fall season is a time when uh, southern residents do come into Puget Sound um, we have um, tried to get out with them opportunistically over the last 15 years and collect scales and feces. And the <clears throat> information to dates uh, from these two uh, approaches show similar but um, somewhat different results. And at the top panel, you see scales and tissue and the majority of those scales are from chum salmon and then the Second most common is from uh, Chinook. And then we also have some steelhead and coho mixed in. But if you take a look at the fecal results in the second panel down, what you're seeing is um, actually more Chinook than chum and, uh, and a lot more prey diversity. So these um, fecal samples likely represent species that were consumed outside of Puget Sound, because as I was mentioning before, the, it takes a it takes a bit of time uh, for um, once they actually kill and eat a fish for it to go through the digestive tract and come out the backside, and we don't know exactly what that passage rate time was. But in discussions with um, uh, colleagues at SeaWorld who have been looking at passage rate times, it can be as quick as three hours, but you know may take up to you know say 24 or so before. Uh, the the uh, prey that they've ingested is uh, comes out uh, as fecal material. So one of the other things that we were interested in looking at was uh, the stocks for the Chinook that were represented here. And so basically when they're in, in Puget Sound, they're eating primarily Puget Sound uh, bound Chinook, which is not a huge surprise given that it's late in season and the fish are returning to their natal rivers. But it was interesting also that uh, nearly 20% were of Canadian origin, and then we had some that were from well outside the area, including um, the Columbia and the Central Oregon coast, as well as the Central Valley. <clears throat> so again, looking at our, our uh, 
our diagram of where the whales are spending their time. And then the next thing to tackle was where the whales, what the whales were eating during the winter months. And the first question was, where are southern resident killer whales in the winter? And this is a primary data gap that was identified in the recovery plan. And in our 2004 research planning workshop, we identified four different ways of trying to look at this. And, and we had a coastal sighting network effort. Uh, we've used passive acoustic recorders, satellite tagging, and ocean class vessel surveys. And it's the uh, essentially the, the latter two um, that I'm gonna talk about primarily uh, for getting at um, the, uh, the prey question. And then I'll talk a little bit about how we've used our, our uh, passive acoustic recorders to look at other aspects of things. So just a little bit about the satellite tagging that we had done for uh, a number of years. We used a spot five uh, transmitter that was essentially uh, held in place on the dorsal fin of the whales. Um, using a pair of darts and the data uh, signals from this transmitter uplink to the Argo system. And that allowed us to basically go out and follow the whales while <clears throat> they were moving up and down the coast during the winter. And we used essentially uh, our ocean class vessel surveys, which we had named pods cruises to do a number of things. But the main thing was to locate and tag southern residents if if we hadn't tagged them or to follow the tagged whales. And part of this was to determine diet. We also collected acoustic recordings and a number of other types of information. And there's just some photos of us, of the Shimada, uh, the ship that we used primarily for this type of work and us in the small boat off the Southern Oregon coast and, and a photo of uh, what it actually looks like when we're following the whales uh, with our high-tech swimming pool net to collect fecal and scale material. And so we essentially, as I mentioned, used uh, these, uh, well, primarily Shimada, but we all also used the, the MAC-2 for the first couple of years. And we used big eye binoculars um, for searching for the whales if we weren't, um, if, if we hadn't satellite tagged them. And we also used a toad array to try to uh, acoustically listen for the whales. And so during the, the years that we had satellite tag data, we um, basically were able to uh, take a look at where the whales were spending their time. And so in the left panel, you basically are seeing that the whales, this was primarily uh, K25, L84, K33, and L95. And what you're seeing here is that their range extended all the way from essentially the Northern Washington coast all the way down to central California. But they spent the bulk majority of their time um, off the Washington coast, particularly between uh, Westport and the Columbia. And then as far as J-Pod was concerned, we had, had had tags on J-26, L-87, when L-87 was with J-Pod, and J-27. And what you saw here was a very different type of uh, habitat use pattern during the winter, where they were essentially splitting their time between the northern portion of the Strait of Georgia and the west entrance to the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And so essentially during this time, we were able to follow whales and collect scale and tissue samples. So for the outer coast, what we saw was that uh, Chinook, again, with very similar proportion, about 80% of their diet during the winter uh, off the outer coast. And that, um, and we also did see a couple of other species, primarily steelhead showing up. Um, and while the fecal samples showed a similar pattern that we saw nearly 70% Chinook, there were also other species such as, uh, again, steelhead was showing up, but also halibut and lingcod, which are two species that don't shed a lot of scales that uh, appear to be import of importance during the winter. And then when we looked at the stock uh, breakdown for this, Essentially, most of the stocks that we were seeing were coming out of um, four different drainages, uh, primarily the Columbia River, but also Puget Sound. Uh, there were Can Canadian drainages, particularly the Fraser was included, and we also saw a fair number coming out of the Central Valley. So essentially 90% of all of the winter prey was coming out of these four drainages. 
over half is coming out of the Columbia River. And it's important to note that in the US, at least 12 of these, uh, six of the 12 stocks that uh, we saw being utilized are also listed under the ESA. And in the Columbia River, we were seeing spring, summer, and fall runs um, <clears throat> being utilized. So um, the um, essentially what we're seeing here is this very broad portfolio of stocks that are being used by the whales um, you know, throughout their range from essentially Central Valley all the way up into um, the uh, Central British Columbia area. And this slide essentially sort of summarizes all of this information throughout the year and that the panel on the left shows that uh, we have um, a lot of species diversity in that top portion of the, of the left graph and then the bottom slide, bottom portion of the figure on the left that shows that the number of species and essentially what you're seeing in, in the winter was just what I was talking about where we're seeing more diversity going on particularly in the fall and winter. And then when we look uh, at this on a species basis across the year, you see this essentially reflected in lower Chinook uh, intake during the fall and winter period. Um, a lot of Chinook taken in the summer when we see an uptick of coho in the fall, uptick of chum in the winter. And then some other species like lincoln and steelhead um, also essentially start to contribute more during these other seasons. So, and this was, um, all of this was in our most recent publication that just came out in the spring of 2021, which is listed down here at the bottom. So one of the things I wanted to talk a little bit about was our use of passive acoustic recorders in, in looking at, um, at this particular issue. And um, so we've used a couple of different types of passive acoustic recorders. We started off using um, these passive acoustic listeners for the first couple of years, and then we transitioned to these ecological acoustic recorders uh, that we've used essentially from 2008 until um, recently here to try to get a better idea of you know, what, where the whales are spending their time, essentially based on using the data we collected from the satellite tag to drive where we were putting these. And you can see on the map, on the right, these are, are some of the locations that we put these uh, over the years. And one of the things we did, we had learned uh, from this uh, was that they were spending a lot of time off the Washington coast. So with some additional support from the US Navy, um, because they have a training area off the Washington coast, particularly in the area of the, um, uh, the Marine Sanctuary, we put out an additional seven, up to 17 recorders off the Washington coast and, um, and took a look at what, um, what uh, occurrence of the whales look like using um, that sort of approach. And this was just recently summarized by Candy in, in a publication that, uh, that she had seen her author here recently that looked at the occurrence of the whales out there. And what, what was really surprising was that Northern residents actually spent a lot of time off the Washington coast. And you can see that in the first panel of the, uh, or the um, second and third panels of this figure. Um, the first panel of this figure shows the encounter durations, which indicates that um, when Northern residents are here, they actually hang around quite a bit. But what you can see is that, um, uh, the northern residents are around a fair bit in the winter and in the fall. Um, southern residents tend to be around more in the fall. This is, I'm talking mainly about the second panel. And then um, when you essentially can um, control this forever you, you, in, the, in panel C, you see basically the same pattern. But uh, again, there was a lot of concern in that, as I mentioned before, in the uh, paper that we had published here last spring was that Northern residents might actually be posing a, a significant um, uh, threat as far as being a competitor with Southern residents. And 
the acoustic data seem to bear this out to a certain extent and that there is a lot of overlap um, in the durations on the outer coast for, for these two different uh, communities. One of the other aspects that I had mentioned before when we were talking about changes in, in size and whatnot was that we were also concerned that there that southern residents might be different eating different uh, age fish compared to northern residents. And if you look at these two plots, what it essentially shows is that uh, as far as chum salmon are concerned, um, northern residents tend to eat older chum salmon than southern residents do. And this is really dramatic when you look at the right panel um, when where you compare Chinook salmon. And this was for Chinook salmon that were consumed on the outer coast versus what northern residents were eating in their summer range in British Columbia. Um, southern residents just end up eating smaller or younger fish, which um, are also younger, are, are also smaller than fish that the northern residents would be eating. So again, this gets back to um, reduced caloric intake. So with all of this diet information in hand, how's it being used? And so this is being put into the uh, action plan for uh, 21 through 25. You'll see here the number one thing on the list is targeting recovery of critical prey. So the information that you're seeing here is being directly used to identify um, stocks and species that are of importance to the whales. And so um, one of the things that's happening is that this information, as well as other information, is being used to guide um, salmon recovery and management decisions. And this includes a number of different groups relative to the state's task force recommendations, um, as well as habitat. And then it's also driving uh, funding uh, through grants from, say, the National Fish and Wildlife uh, Foundation and some of these other groups that are out there. And so uh, essentially, um, this information was used as far as trying to increase available prey. This was part of the consultations with the Southeast Alaska Fisheries and the 2019 Puget Sound Fisheries, in, which essentially was a coordinated effort to try to increase hatchery, hatchery productions in Washington state. And so this information is going to be, you know, and will continue to be important in guiding those sorts of actions to try to put more fish into the system in places that the whales are in fact spending time. And so at that point, I, at this point, I'm going to wrap up uh, my talks and I will take questions uh, in regarding to the information I just presented. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, we are restarting and I, I wanted to mention um, for those of you that I, I know participate in our whale sighting network and send whale sight, sighting um, information to us, that data goes to NOAA Fisheries and Brad Hansen and into the Orca Master that he um, he mentioned uh, in the credits of his graphs there of Southern resident um, presence um, in the Salish Sea. Um, so I just wanna encourage people to keep sending in sightings because it does um, inform NOAA fisheries of where the whales are and that helps them figure out where the, you know, which salmon they are preying on and which habitats and salmon are most important to them. And through that, as um, he also shared, we have seen such a huge increase of the bigs, mammal eating orcas um, in what once was mainly just Southern resident habitat. And that's really shifted over the years. So um, thank you for being part of the community science of sending in your sightings um, to inform all this great research. And I also wanted to, it looks like we're almost all back here. Um, so I wanted to also mention that we will do a um, Q&A session um, after all the talks at 7.50. Um, and you can type your questions in the Q&A um, uh, box down at the bottom of your uh, screen there. Um, 
And I, in our beginning um, hassles with Zoom, I, I forgot to introduce myself and Howard. I'm Susan Berta with Orca Network. Um, and this is Howard Garrett and um, Cindy Hansen and Katie Watkins and Stephanie Raymond are um, our staff that are helping us tonight and trying to chase away the Zoom gremlins and um, keep things running. So um, we are glad you are all here and most of you are back. <laughs> and I will let Howard introduce Jacques White. Who's next. I will quickly introduce Jacques, who has <laughs> been director of Long Live the King since 2010. Uh, and before that, was a director of marine conservation at the Nature Conservancy in Washington and director of science and habitat programs for people for Puget Sound. Jacques is one of those uh, wonderful and valuable scientists who is equally comfortable doing the direct field research out there in the streams and in the water and summarizing, interpreting and presenting that to the public so that we can understand how nature works out there. Um, Jacques has his uh, PhD in environmental sciences and uh, he is a homeboy. He got his undergraduate work uh, from the University of Washington. And so with that, thank you for joining us today, Jacques, and uh, take it away. Thanks so much, Howard and Susan. It's great to be here with uh, my colleagues that have been partners in the Sailor Sea Marine Survival Project and people like yourselves and, and uh, Stephanie I've worked with for many years. So uh, thank you so much for putting this on. That was a great way to kick it off to have the, the talk from Dr. Hansen. So I am going to share my screen if that's okay. Um, and uh, can you see the presentation now? Yes, yes. I can see it. <laughs> Okay, that should be my title slide that says Sailor Sea Marine Survival Project. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna, uh, this, this is gonna be difficult because I'm, I'm summarizing essentially uh, seven years of work by 200 people uh, into 20 minutes. And so I'm gonna go as quickly as I can. Um, you know, if I miss something, maybe I can cover it in the questions. Uh, this work is principally um, uh, put, the, the presentation was put together by Michael Schmidt, uh, who was the project coordinator on the US side, and Iris Kemp, who was a project scientist who worked for Long of the Kings, and Brian, R uh, Brian Riddle, who was then the CEO of the Pacific Salmon Foundation, and Isabel Perlman. So this is the summary work of, of four people, but it really represents the work of, of uh, over 200 folks. Um, quite an ambitious project. Okay, so now let me see if I can advance it? Did the slide advance? Great. Okay, so what is what is marine survival and why are we looking at it and why is it a potential problem? Um, <clears throat> so for Chinook, which is the fish in the top panel, uh, coho and steelhead uh, in Puget Sound and the Strait of Georgia, marine survival was known to be a problem for at least three decades. And Another tip for watching this, if you've got a number of panels, what I like to do is to minimize the panels on the side of my screen by uh, hitting the minimize button. And then you can see better uh, the materials that I'm gonna be presenting. So uh, marine survival is essentially the percent of smolts that leave a river mouth into salt water that return as adults. And it's a measure of marine productivity or the effectiveness of the marine environment to support these three species. Um, the reason why we looked at these three species is that they had the most significant impacts on marine survival. Uh, pink salmon, chum salmon, uh, and sockeye salmon were either uh, bouncing around with no trend or uh, had relatively high marine survival or not marine survival that was trending in any direction. But for Chinook, um, uh, for Chinook and Puget Sound in the Strait of Georgia, marine survival over the period of time from the mid 1970s through uh, 2010 decreased by about 50%. While marine survival on the coast, if you take, you know, look at 10 year running averages, fell but also rebounded so that by the time that we did the study, there was really no net change in marine survival for that species. 
For coho, it was much more dramatic. There was about a 75% decrease in marine survival uh, for Puget Sound in the Strait of Georgia, what we call the Salish Sea. And for steelhead, which we only had good data for Puget Sound, uh, the, dr the drop in marine survival from the mid-1970s was quite dramatic, about 90%. Marine survival for coastal stocks uh, and emptying directly into the Pacific Ocean, including the Columbia River, declined uh, through the 1990s, but then rebounded some. That, and that is a trend that we did not see for Puget Sound. So here's the scope of the study. Um, we had, as I said, we had over 200 people, over 60 organizations. Uh, we raised over $20 million, and that was matched by nearly another $20 million in funds from our partners. The project went for seven years. Uh, it occurred in both Canada and the U.S. And, and really, one question we were looking at is what affects the survival of young Chinook, Coho, and Steelhead in the Salish Sea? So this is what um, Michael Schmidt liked to call our NASCAR slide. And these are a number of the partners. Um, uh, the Nisqually Indian Tribe was one of our key partners for this program and a major funder. Other major funders include, in the U.S. side at least, included the Pacific Salmon Commission, which provided two and a half million dollars in seed funding to get this off the ground. The Washington State Legislature and the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And we received about 10% of the funding in private dollars from the Boeing Company and from the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation. But this is really a major effort, again, coordinated by the Pacific Salmon Foundation in Canada and Long of the Kings in the US. Um, we looked all over the place. So we studied uh, from Olympia uh, or Nisqually Delta all the way up to near Johnstone Strait. We looked at uh, predators, we looked at food resources and we did some modeling. Um, and, and again, this was, this was done over a, a seven year period of time. Um, we, we spent a couple of years working to synthesize the data while some data was still being collected. Um, and the results, the, the study findings um, were compiled and are available. I'll show the website in a second. We have a long, uh, full report from the study, uh, which is over 100 pages. We have a, a executive summary that's available online. And there's, I think, a really great website that has a storyboard on it that talks about the major findings of the project. Um, the results and the recommended actions are uh, opinions of the lead US and Canadian scientists. There was a synthesis panel that was put together. Um, and uh, there are a number of those recommendations that I'll try to run through later. So here is the website. If you want to go learn more about this, it's marinesurvivalproject.com. And this is a shared website by all of the partners. Um, so what is driving marine survival? Well, juvenile salmon uh, depend on a number of factors to keep them alive and allow them to grow. Um, Climate is what we expect and weather is what we get. And what we get is what drives the kind of plankton production in terms of the quantity, the quality and the timing. And that in turn drives the amount of uh, zooplankton that would be available for juvenile fish to eat and fish larvae. If uh, marine survival is driven by food resources related to climate or some other condition, we call that bottoms up control. Um, Survival can also be modified by things like diseases and toxins, uh, or the fish can actually just be eaten. And, and if predation prominently is the predominant factor controlling juvenile fish survival, we'll call that top-down control. So let's look at some of these factors. I'm gonna cut right to the chase and then I'm gonna do some more explanations. So <clears throat> for coho and chinook, Food, food abundance or food quality was considered the primary source of poor marine survival, although predation also played an important role. For juvenile steelhead, uh, which really only spend a couple of weeks in the marine environment in Puget Sound, they, they're a two-year-old trout essentially when they swim out of a river and they swim like crazy for the ocean. Um, the primary source of mortality in the Salish Sea was seen to be uh, predation and largely by harbor seals. So there are other factors. Um, habitat availability uh, had an had a important impact in particular places where, particularly in estuarine areas where habitat had been lost significantly for Chinook. Also shoreline habitat controlled the availability of forage fish and food resources for coho and Chinook. Contaminants in urban estuaries appeared to be important 
disease was important in the Strait of Georgia, but not necessarily in Puget Sound for Coho and Chinook, but was uh, considered to be a factor for um, steelhead coming out of South Puget Sound rivers, although not South Hood Canal rivers. And finally, there seems to be a factor in terms of release timing for hatcheries uh, and timing of food availability that may be interacting and causing problems for marine survival. So let's dig into this a little bit, food supply. So um, when, when juvenile Chinook and coho are young, when they first enter the marine environment, zooplankton are very important and particularly crab larvae. Um, as they grow, they start to feed on other things, including uh, juvenile uh, forage fish, particularly Pacific herring. But if Pacific herring are too big, when um, juvenile salmon are ready to switch to them, there can be a, a diet mismatch. So not every herring population supports juvenile salmon. Turns out cherry point herring are really critically important and have been in decline. So what are some of the factors that would, from based on climate that could control production of food for salmon? Things like river flow and river input, uh, increased in, uh, solar radiation, increasing water temperature, uh, decreasing winds that can reduce the mixing and cause phytoplankton to grow earlier, and nutrients, uh, particularly uh, pro provided by human activities, either through runoff from agriculture or direct inputs from sewage treatment plants. Um, we're also concerned about a mismatch in timing. If you think about climate changing and spring occurring earlier, uh, that will cause a chain of events like phytoplankton blooms, zooplankton blooms, and if the fish are coming out of the rivers at a particular time expecting resources to be there and they're not, then they could fail or, or not thrive as well as they could. This is particularly a problem for hatchery fish that may uh, come out at a fixed period of time. And this graph on the right shows how hatchery fish used to be released from facilities over a fairly broad period of time. But over time, for a number of reasons, one was that this was successful and we had pretty high productivity by focusing release at least um, uh, earlier, uh, in, in earlier decades, um, and also in order for them not to interfere with recovery of wild stock. So if we control when hatchery fish come out of the river, they'll be less likely to compete over time with, with wild stocks that they're, we're trying to recover. The problem with this is as the environment changes and we're locked into release around say the third week of May, um, that can be, lead to less survival and poorer performance uh, by our hatchery populations, particularly looking at Chinook in this case. So to sum up food supply, um, looks like uh, changes in the environment are affecting the food, the type and a, an amount of food available and the timing when it's available. Looks like competition between, it's possible that competition between Chinook and coho and other species like chum and pink may be occurring, but, but we didn't really identify that. Could be competition between fish larvae uh, and fish pop juvenile fish populations and, and coho and chinook that may be sort of out of sync. Um, concerns, some concerns about timing, particularly related to hatchery fish and when they enter the marine environment, but could also be occurring for wild stocks. And, and the, the scientists working on the project evaluated the potential impacts of ocean acidification in terms of affecting food supply and did not consider that an important factor now, but could easily uh, grow in importance if uh, Puget Sound becomes more acidic. Finally, um, if, if there is competition for uh, forage fish from predators like, like seals and sea lions, that could be impacting the food available for at least coho and chinook. So predation. Um, I, I know we were talking about uh, the increase in bigs killer whales in Puget Sound in the Strait of Georgia in the Salish Sea. And I think that there is a very good reason, one very good reason for that, and that is that the Marine Mammal Protection Act, at least as it pertains to pinnipeds, has been a smashing success. Uh, harbor seal populations in the region have increased by seven to tenfold, depending on where you are in the system. Um, and that has resulted in a significant food supply for Biggs killer whales. It has also resulted in significant predation pressure on Chinook, Coho, and Steelhead. Even though individual harbor seals don't eat a lot of coho, chinook, and sealhead through an annual cycle of their diet, because there are so many of them, they are having a big impact. So let's look at that. Uh, for chinook and coho in Puget Sound, it looks like the, uh, the in ingestion rates of those populations are somewhere on the order of 10 to 40% for chinook and uh, 
five to 10% for coho in Puget Sound. If we look at the Strait of Georgia and look at the panels on the bottom here, you can see that the, the predation rates on coho and Chinook are really quite a bit higher in the Strait of Georgia on the order of solidly 40% or even higher for coho. So that's a significant impact on those populations. For steelhead, um, and those data were derived from looking at um, feces of, of pinnipeds and calculating the amount ingested times the numbers available over a period of time. For steelhead, there just aren't enough steelhead around to get that kind of data from feces. So what we did is put acoustic transmitters in steelhead and release them into the environment and track where they go. It turns out a lot of them end up around seal hull outs. Also, when we, when we um, tag them in places like the mouth of the Nisqually River, we see steelhead swimming like a fish for a while and then shifting their behavior and swimming back and forth up and down the river, more like a seal, which indicating ingestion. Um, there is some discussion that, that the way we run our hatcheries and releasing all the fish at once may trigger a predation effect that might not be quite so common for wild populations that are coming out of the river over a broader period of time. Um, so that might be exacerbating the problem. And then um, one of the things that we did notice is that when there are more forage fish available in the environment, particularly thinking about bay anchovy in South Puget Sound near the Nisqually River Delta, we see better survival rates for juvenile steelhead, probably not due to ingestion of the anchovy by the steelhead, but due to prey swamping for their predators, harbor seals. Um, so to summarize on predation, it looks like um, that uh, predation is dominantly occur is is predominantly occurring uh, because there are so many seals available now, or so many seals in the environment that um, that might be mitigated by the presence of forage fish populations. That there may be a timing uh, effect associated with that. That if we are releasing hatchery fish all at once, it may be stimulating a predation impact. We did not see strong selective feeding by harbor seals. Uh, on juvenile fish, but that's difficult to determine because it's harder to trace individual interactions. And again, for steelhead, predation was the dominant source of mortality. Um, and with respect to the availability of, of um, forage fish, climate again may have an impact there. So what about habitat? This slide shows uh, the, 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 um, per, the time frequency of salmon moving out of a river, Chinook salmon in this case, moving out of the Green River and the Skagit River. Uh, the first peak in March is predominantly made of smaller fry out migrants. And the second peak in May is made of par out migrants, which are bigger. Both systems see these kinds of out, -migra out migration. But when we look at the otoliths of returning adults and when those fish first hit salt water, we see very small contribution in rivers like the Green River, this, this trend is uh, replicated in places like the Cedar River or the Ship Canal in Lake Washington and the Puyallup River in Tacoma between zero and 3% con fry contribution to returning adults. Whereas in rivers like the Skagit or the Cowichan River on the east side of Vancouver Island uh, or the Nooksack River, we see very high, nearly a third of the returns are made up of these early outmigrant fish. So there's some difference in the, in the thing that we think is, is related to this is the impacts of development in the estuary on the success of these early out migrating fish. And so this says estuary uh, habitat is critically important for Chinook. Um, and then a second question might be, um, at what cost do you pursue that kind of work and what types of habitat restoration might be the most effective? Disease and contaminants. Here's some data from our friends up in Canada, uh, looking at the disease prevalence uh, in Chinook and Coho, and what they're finding is pretty high uh, incidence of disease in the Strait, Strait of Georgia, more so in the summer. Interestingly, if you look at the panel on the right, the, the small amount of data they collected in Puget Sound showed no incidence or almost no incidence of disease in Coho and Chinook. Um, this might be uh, because of the higher prevalence of marine net pen uh, facilities in the Strait of Georgia compared to Puget Sound, where, where there are quite not very many. In terms of contaminants, uh, what we found is that juvenile fish uh, coming out of urbanized estuaries have higher concentrations of contaminants. Um, flame retardants was not important except in the Snohomish where it was very, very high for some individuals. PCBs unfortunately have been banned for decades but still persist in the environment. And if you look at um, older salmon in the Puget Sound Basin, 
we see that PBDEs or flame retardants are fairly low and at least safe from a human health threshold. We're not sure if that's harmful to the fish, but PCBs are high uniformly. So any fish pretty much anywhere in Puget Sound Basin are exceeding the human health thresholds. Uh, for humans, I would not be a big fan of eating a lot of black mouth Chinook given this data. And for our Southern resident killer whales that may be eating resident Chinook at times in Puget Sound, it's, it's going to add to their body burden of persistent toxins like PCBs. Uh, what can we do to address marine survival? Well, there's two main uh, uh, ways to look at this. One is what are factors that we have to adapt to because they're due to global changes and we can't really affect the underlying conditions. We will have a difficult time changing ocean acidity, acidification, we'll have a difficult time changing the seasonality and when the plankton blooms occur. Uh, but there are things we can do to adapt to those by, by making sure that we have, well, I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. This is the over, overview here. The other is to fix local impacts. We can look at abundances or the, the immediate impacts of things like seals. Um, we can look at the timing of how fish come out of, the, out of our basins, both for wild populations and for, for hatcheries. Uh, we, can, we can fix shoreline and nearshore estuarine habitat. We can restore our forage fish populations. We can address contaminants and potentially diseases. Uh, and we can, we can look at competition between different stocks. Um, so in terms of food availability, if we recognize that the climate is changing, we can uh, look at ways to uh, uh, increase the availability of prey, uh, or at least look at ways to develop our monitoring and, and response strategies so we understand what's happening to the fish. Another thing is to continue to assess juvenile Chinook and coho growth and survival. This is something that hadn't been done routinely before the Marine Survival Project, and we think it's critically important. Um, to continue. Uh, a second factor I would suggest is restoring estuary and near, to our, near shore habitat for salmon, uh, for things like Pacific herring and sand lance, uh, and also juvenile crab, which was a critically important food resource for small Chinook coming out of our, our rivers and estuaries. Um, and this means perhaps supporting soft shore uh, initiatives where we're looking at removing bulkheads and replacing them with more natural shoreline types that foster forage fish production. Um, also uh, looking at um, recovering and protecting and maintaining the diversity of our herring populations. If the timing is important, then some of the populations like the Cherry Point population that tend to spawn later and produce smaller fish later into the summer that are more available for salmon to eat could be a, an effective strategy. Um, support salmon life history, history variability. This isn't just in hatcheries. We could, we would um, want to perhaps put even more emphasis on maintaining the diversity and the variability in our wild populations of Chinook and Coho um, in, in the environments of the Salish Sea. Uh, and also looking at, and this is ongoing, the, the Nisqually tribe along with the Kings and others, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and folks in Canada are looking at different hatchery rearing strategies and release strategies to increase marine survival and also look at ways to increase the size at return in order to provide bigger and more effective food resources for southern resident killer whales. Um, predation, again, supporting life history variability uh, through habitat restoration, population management, experimenting with very, various hatchery rearing could be a, a strategy to also reduce predation by broadening the, the time that fish migrate out of rivers or hatcheries into the marine environment. Um, predation. So it has been suggested uh, more than once that one way to fix the seal populations or the predation is to uh, reduce the number of harbor seals in the system. WDFW did a modeling exercise to find out what it would take to reduce those populations to a significant level that would have an impact on marine survival. And if, if we did that generically, it would have to be a removal of 50% or more of the population. That is a difficult um, sale in the current in, uh, political environment. And so um, we are looking at other strategies to address that are more targeted for now. And those strategies include things like determining where there's hot spots, assessing whether hatchery pulses have, a, have an impact and can we improve those. Um, facilitating fish passage past migration barriers like the Hood Canal Bridge, which is resulting in 50% loss year over year of juvenile uh, out-migrating steelhead, which were at one time 
a pretty important source of nutrition for uh, southern resident killer whales when those steelhead populations were at historic highs, but now those populations are really, really small. Um, utilize predator deterrence, things like acoustic startle devices in key hotspots. Um, remove things that, that facilitate predation, things like log booms or derelict barges or boats that provide artificial habitat for seals to hang out in places where they can eat uh, juveniles, Chinook and coho and steelhead. Uh, recover forage fish populations so that they provide an alternative food resource for um, seals and, and other predators. Um, and in, if necessary, or where we think that this would be helpful, we could perform experimental removals of seals from areas where we know that they're a nuisance, we know they're causing problems, and it might be beneficial as, as a targeted or specific action. In other areas, in places like BC, they're finding that low river flows are actually increasing mortality in the lower river where, um, where you have increases in predators, whether it's, it's marine mammals swimming up the river or birds feeding on the fish. Strategically address contaminants, remove them, uh, de determine PCB pathways to understand what's going on in the food web. Um, in the Strait of Georgia and the Fraser Basin, they're trying to, to get a handle on, on the contaminants there, although DFO has been crippled by reduced funding. And some of the things that we're trying to look at is, is uh, contaminants of emerging concerns um, and, and things that cause sudden death and in, in coho in, in uh, returning as adults may also be affecting juvenile salmon as they migrate out. Um, improving our diagnostic uh, in terms of protecting uh, fish from, from diseases uh, and also understanding what's going on with them in the face of climate change. Uh, in maintaining and improving our monitoring of, of things like basic oceanography, zooplankton populations, uh, juvenile salmon and herring populations, and also looking and getting better data on seal and sea lion demographics and diets. Uh, finally, uh, improving forecasting and recovery um, and recovery efforts with new, new forms of modeling. And we are in, in the process of developing an ecosystem model, Atlantis model, for Puget Sound in the Strait of Georgia that summarizes all the information that we collected and can help us uh, model different recovery strategies. So that's it. And thanks uh, based on, you know, from me, but also from the 60 partners that participated in this and our funders. And I will stop and, and take, take questions later. I'll hang around. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jacques. Appreciate that and no surprise videos popping up. So that's a good sign. <laughs> um, um, we appreciate everyone um, coming back online and joining us. And we are very happy to have Tara Galuska join us from the Orca Recovery Office. And she will be talking about um, the importance of Puget Sound um, fall salmon for the Southern Resident Orcas. Thanks so much for joining us, Tara. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Jacques, for all the fabulous information you just provided. Um, let me go ahead and start my um, share my screen. Let's see. Doesn't look like I have. Oh, here it is. OK, thank you. So hope folks can see this that popped up. Uh, so I'm gonna take a lot of what, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what, uh, what Jock discussed and also what Brad discussed in terms of the importance of fall salmon runs and relate that to really critical habitat restoration actions that, that need to take place um, primary, all over the state but primarily uh, in talking about Puget Sound fall uh, Chinook and um, the importance of habitat restoration for uh, Chinook in, in this area. So thanks for having me. And we, I really liked how Brad talked about the, the three issues facing Southern resident killer whales in terms of the um, relationship to prey. So, 
We know that there are too few fish out there for these orcas. We know there's too much pollution and, uh, and that there's impacts from vessel noise and all related to, to, to prey abundance and availability to the whales. We're getting a little delay here in the slides. There we go. Um, so this, this slide uh, is really showing how uh, toxic contaminants will enter the waterways. And um, you know we've got stormwater effects, as Jacques mentioned, we've got contaminants coming into Puget Sound. Um, the, one of the, the latest discoveries or issues is tire dust um, impacts to coho directly. Um, but this slide illustrates toxics that get into the water, into the zooplankton and um, the zo you know, zooplankton uh, eaten by forage fish, then into the salmon. And once the Southern resident killer whales will eat these salmon, then it will uh, get into their fat stores. And then they of course pass that down to the, the calves when they nurse them. So those, that's a major issue is, is, is contaminants in prey. Um, and then echolocation, um, the Southern resident killer whales, this, is, this illustrates how they find their food, this, this melon area on top of their head, they send out clicks and they bounce off of their prey and, um, and that's how they find their prey. And so when there's a lot of vessel traffic in, in, in the range of Southern kill, killer whales um, within certain distance of them, then they're not able to uh, forage as effectively. So again, that, um, that vessel noise impacts the way that they can find their food. Um, and and, and this, this slide is showing how uh, the primary diet of, of um, Southern resident killer whales has been shown to be Chinook as, as Brad Hansen talked about. Um, and, and this is particularly important in the fall in within Puget Sound. Uh, I think, as he mentioned, the majority of their diet is Chinook, although they do switch to coho, chum and steelhead later on in, in the fall. Um, summer months, they're mainly feeding on uh, Chinook returning to the Fraser River. But again, in the fall, uh, it's the Chinook that are returning to Puget Sound that are that are really critical. Um, and then in late fall, they'll, they'll also be found to eat uh, chum and coho. So we know that um, there are times when the Southern resident killer whales head further south into Puget Sound. Um, when, when Chinook uh, when Chinook are decreasing, they'll, they'll go ahead and diversify their prey and look for chum and um, other coho. So the, the problem um, with, with in Washington state is that 15 of our, our salmon species are, are listed under the Endangered Species Act. Act. So you'll see that some, um, some of our salmonids are approaching a recovery goal, such as Hood Canal summer chum. So, um, so that's really good news. We've been at this salmon recovery work for 20, over 20 years, and we are seeing some improvements in some runs, but um, as you see in the, in the red zone there in crisis, you've got Puget Sound Chinook that um, are really not doing well. And Jock spoke to that in his marine survival um, study, and you see Puget Sound steelhead in there as well. And so um, there, there are many impacts, as you just learned, to those, to those species. And, um, and, and because they're so important to Southern resident killer whales, we've, we're really looking to ways to um, improve habitat, improve conditions for Puget Sound Chinooks so that, that Southern resident killer whales can, can have uh, more abundance in their diet. So as a result of, of this uh, combination of all these ESA listed salmonids and also the Southern resident killer whale crisis, um, and declines in their population. The, the um, governor uh, wrote an executive order in 2018 and created the Southern Resident Killer Whale Task Force and directed the task force to implement early actions and also develop priority recommendations for orca recovery. And so this just is a, a quick overview. And I wanna thank, um, whoops, I wanna thank Mindy Roberts from the Washington Environmental Council for creating this slide. Um, there's 49 recommendations, and as you can see, 1 through 16 are related to creating more salmon abundance um, for the killer whales, several recommendations for re reducing vessel noise so they can find their prey, and then um, reducing toxic contaminants, and also a few to address 
um, climate change and future growth um, as, as this region is facing uh, really quite a bit of growth in the last two decades and more to come. Um, so uh, as a result of the task force recommendations, one of the recommendations was for the um, for DFW and NOAA to create a priority, uh, uh, which to create a list of which prey species uh, are most important to Southern resident killer whales. And Brad spoke to this a little bit in his presentation. Um, so this was a model um, done by NOAA and DFW and the Northwest Fishery Science Center to identify the most important prey to SRKW. Um, and so what I wanted to also talk about are some of the policy impl implications of, um, of having these prioritized species. Uh, it, it does help us target recovery actions um, for salmonids that have the greatest benefit to Southern resident killer whales. Um, so this is a, a snapshot of, of the, the top species that were prioritized in the model. Um, this work was done in 2018, and it's my understanding that um, NOAA is working with DFW to uh, uh, update this. Um, this is done based on best available science at the time. And so these are the, the priority stocks. And as you can see, hopefully you can see it's small writing, but um, the number one uh, stocks for these whales are Northern and Southern Puget, Puget Sound Chinook in the fall. And so uh, we've really got to focus recovery efforts. And um, to date, there has not been, uh, there's been quite a bit of salmon recovery work and funding um, directed at um, Puget Sound Chinook, but there's, there, it hasn't been in the context of, of uh, killer whale recovery. And we haven't had this prioritized stock list prior to the task force recommendations and, and the work that, that came out of that. Um, so just to dig in a little further, um, you've got these, these are the river stocks uh, for the Northern Puget Sound Fall Chinook, and then the Southern Puget Sound Fall Chinook uh, include Nisqually, Puyallup Green, Duwamish, Deschutes, Hood Canal, and Northern are um, Elwha, Nooksack, Dungeness, Skagit, Stiligwamish, and Snohomish. And so some of these watersheds are, are as, as mentioned, are very highly impacted um, by urbanization. And some have uh, been altered just dramatically uh, over the over the course of the last century. Um, so jumping into uh, recommendations to improve prey for southern resident killer whales, um, this slide is just kind of showing uh, an overall schematic of some of the major state-funded grant programs um, in wa in Washington State, and. Uh, the first column is the 1719 biennium. The second one is, is 1921. And the last one is where we're at. So one of the major recommendations um, of the task force was to increase funding um, for salmon, rest, salmon restoration in Washington state and increase funding going specifically to estuaries. Um, so as you can see, uh, you know, the, the trend on the bottom line, we've gone from 140 million to 178 to 192. So there has been some increase. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of uh, folks that are working hard on salmon recovery in the state. And I like to um, thank and attribute all uh, the, the increase in funding to all of those partners. And also like to think that, that, that the ORCA task force recommendations had something to do with, with some of this increase as well. Um, the, the, the unfortunate or thing about all of this, though, is that salmon recovery is only funded at about 20% of the need in Washington state. So while we see these numbers increasing, it's still not nearly enough to um, implement the, the salmon recovery plans that have been written to improve, um, improve salmon habitat and improve the population runs of those uh, 15 listed species that we have in the state. Um, so one of the one of the good policy impl imp implications um, that came from the task force recommendations and from knowing what those priority stocks are, including the the Puget Sound um, Chinook uh, fall and uh, southern southern and northern Chinook, um, are that the Salmon Recovery Funding Board, which is the board that oversees um, several of the funding programs listed uh, prior including the Pacific Coast Salmon Recovery Fund, they created a new program called uh, the Targeted Investment Program. And so 
that just got passed last year. And basically the, the board could choose one or more priorities for the biennium. And the because of the work of the task force recommendations, um, Southern resident worker of whale recovery was included as, um, as one of the uh, targeted investments to, to be funded this biennium. And so that's great, great news for the whales. Um, and uh, and the, the funding for Southern Resident Orca Recovery will go to restoring or protecting habitat in areas determined critical to successful orca feeding. And so in 2022, 3.7 million will be available um, for those priority stocks identified for fish and wildlife and, um, and by fish and wildlife and NOAA. And, uh, and so the, this program is statewide, but, um, but the, the Puget Sound stocks are, are known as one of the highest priority stocks. And the criteria available for this takes the stocks um, and the scoring into, into consideration. And so I'm just gonna show you next some examples of um, high priority restoration projects that are going on or are planned in the state and um, are also potentially in need of a, additional funding to, um, in the future to do these kind of large river restoration projects. Um, we're, at a, we're at a point, I think in time in the recovery community where there are really, really large scale restoration projects that are needed to be done to have a, an impact for Chinook. Chinook uh, salmon like these large river systems, and they and they also need really healthy estuaries to rear in. So, for spawning, um, they'll want to want to have large rivers restored, and and also estuaries restored. So, what we're looking at on this slide is the Dungeness River Levee Setback Project, and this um, was funded by the Salmon Recovery Funding Board, and is a partnership project with the Jamestown Scallam Tribe and Clallam County. And there's many partners involved. And basically what you're looking at here on this slide is, is an old um, levee um, alongside the river that's going to be removed and set, and it's, uh, it, the setback levee has already been built. And this project will, um, will open up about a hundred, I think, uh, let me look, 177 acres of uh, floodplain. And uh, it's close to the estuary as well. And so this is gonna be critical spawning habit, habitat. And what happens is the river um, just kind of rips through here. It's constrained by a levee. And so by, by taking down this levee and setting it back, it'll give the river more room to meander and it will let gravel settle and it will create an environment where those large uh, Chinook can spawn. Um, and so these are the kind of projects that we're kind of looking at, these large complex projects. This, this is gonna cost, um, this, this project will cost over $20 million. There's um, more partners than I can name on this, but these are the kind of large scale restoration projects that we need to accomplish um, to improve the habitat for fall, uh, for fall Chinook in Puget Sound. This river uh, is on the Olympic Peninsula and dumps into the Strait of Juan de Fuca and um, happens to be in my hometown of Squim. Um, this is another project that got uh, accomplished recently. And this is a, the, a Nooksack Dam removal up in the city of Bellingham with many partners, uh, funding from the Puget Sound Acquisition and Restoration Program through the Puget Sound Partnership, um, some funding to do design work from the Pacific Coastal Salmon Recovery Fund. And um, again, this is a high priority uh, project identified in the Puget Sound uh, Chinook Recovery Plan, and really important to uh, to get more Chinook um, into into Puget Sound and into the bellies of southern resident killer whales. Um, again, a very complex uh, multi million dollar project. This one had private funding from the Paul Allen Foundation as well. Um, but you know, these are the kind of projects that that need to happen on these really large rivers. They're expensive, they're complex, um, and they take a lot of fortitude and partnership to accomplish. Um, and and the other thing about this project is it's uh, it's it's fish passage removal, and it opened up forty acres of habitat. Um, there are multiple uh, thousands on of fish passage projects around Puget Sound um, that are that are identified as needing to be removed. 
um, and creating barriers. Not all of those are Chinook barriers, but there are there are still more large scale Chinook barrier projects out there that need to be accomplished um, for these fish. And then I'm, I'm showing this one finally. This is on the Duckabush River, which is in Hood Canal. And um, again, uh, high priority Chinook project and also CHUM. And so, um, you know, this is, this, is, this is in an area of high CHUM production. Um, summer CHUM, that's one of uh, almost a success story. Um, it's not delisted yet, but it, it the, the summer CHUM numbers have really increased. Um, due to a lot of restoration efforts um, and cleanup around Hood Canal, cleanup of septics, uh, and also just really uh, putting a lot of funding into habitat restoration projects. Um, this is Highway 101 along the Duckabush River along Hood Canal, and this project proposes to build a causeway over these um, old uh, bridges that are constraining the estuary. And so again, this is a project of utmost importance for uh, Chinook and for uh, Chum. It will create um, 33, it will open up 33 acres of estuary habitat that is practically blocked now by those um, pinched points along the river. And these are critical areas that sh the Chinook salmon need for um, that transition period of after they, after they spawn and lay eggs and live in the river and grow a little bigger. Um, this is a critical habitat where they will come out and um, rear in the estuary um, for that transition period to salt water and to grow a little bigger and feed there before that they he then head out to the open ocean. And so these are, the, these are the kind of projects that are critically important. This is a design project that was funded um, and is underway currently. And I believe it's DFW that has a $50 million request into the legislature right now to, uh, for construction funding during this 2020 uh, special session. Um, and so this is a project that is in partnership with the Army Corps of Engineers. It's uh, what we call a Puget Sound Nearshore Est Estuary Restoration Program project or PISNERP, you might hear that term. Um, that is a partnership program that is with the Army Corps of Engineer engineers and the Department of Fish and Wildlife identify major estuary projects around Puget Sound um, that need funding. And these are multi-million dollar, really complex projects. So again, these are the, these are the, the kind of targeted uh, restoration projects that are needed out there to improve um, the, the salmon habitat for Southern resident killer whales. And just going back to these two projects, these also were um, received funding through the um, Pacific Salmon Treaty funding through NOAA. Um, these, um, there was uh, funding identified uh, for the Pacific Salmon Treaty, and that was a, also an ORCA task force recommendation to increase, um, to fully fund the Pacific Salmon Treaty. Uh, so the, the NOAA Fisheries has gotten $11 million in their budget last year, this year, and the plan uh, will be another 11 million next year. And they use the priority stocks for Southern resident killer whales to identify where, uh, where they would target that funding. Um, so uh, a great portion of that funding is going to these restoration projects. This project received 4 million and this project received 2 million. Um, and they also um, are putting some of that funding into uh, hatchery programs to increase, um, increase Salmonid numbers for southern resident killer whales. So looking ahead, um, there's so there's so much work to, to do, and uh, and Jacques alluded to to some of the other work. This is kind of focusing on some of the habitat work, but um, currently the statewide salmon recovery strategy is um, being updated and underway, and and we hope that that is out um, from the governor in in sometime this fall and that will guide, help guide recovery actions um, for the next many years. Um, there's the Federal Puget Sound SOS bill, which would create a Puget Sound office in the, uh, in the EPA, and that would bring a lot of, potentially a lot of funding and attention to the Puget Sound. Um, the Federal Infrastructure Bill, which is, is um, you know, as we've seen in the news, still, still um, being negotiated, and we're hoping to get funding for restoration work um, uh, uh, around the state and, and, and in Puget Sound to increase um, habitat. 
And then, uh, you know, we just need in, in continued and increased state funding for salmon restoration habitat projects around the state, critical to um, critical to fall Chinook, Chum, and all of the listed species that are important to uh, southern resident killer whales. This is a statewide issue. There are there are while while I'm focusing on Puget Sound right now, there are also needs um, in you know lo Lower Columbia, Upper Columbia, Snake, all around the state. Um, to produce fish for these uh, for these amazing animals, and then finally, I just want to end on the note saying that accomplishing these large, complex projects um, that make a difference to Chinook and other salmon species will be critical. Um, as I as I've mentioned, we've been doing salmon recovery for for an, a long time, and we we've done many many projects, but we've got some really large, complex projects ahead of us. And I think that's a good segue uh, to, to David and Willie, uh, Willie Frank talking about um, some of the work that they are probably envisioning um, in, in their neck of the woods. So thanks for that uh, time today. And I really appreciate the opportunity to share some of the, some of the projects that are going on in Puget Sound and the importance to the, to the Chinook and Chum and Coho. Thank you so much, Tara. Really appreciate um, your your talk and being part of this workshop. Um, and we will move right along. I know we're a little bit behind. Um, and I um, believe uh, Willie had to leave due to an emergency. So it may just be David Trout with the Nisqually tribe. And I did want to mention that we do have on our Orca Network YouTube channel there, um, it's a 35 or 40 minute video interview that we did in June for Orca Month that is excellent. Um, so check that out if you uh, weren't at that event or haven't seen it. Um, and they both have wonderful things to say and I won't waste any more of David's time. And thank you for joining us again, David. Really appreciate it. You bet. And thank you for having us. Um, I do need to apologize for my chairman. Uh, the life of a chairman of a tribe means you're working 24 seven. And so he got a phone call. He had to go deal with a critical issue. He's going to try to join us later, but there's no uh, promises that he'll be able to resolve it that quickly. Um, so he sends his regrets. Um, so thank you all. And thank you all for hanging in there tonight. Uh, it's a rainy, blustery evening and still we've got a crowd here and I really appreciate that. Uh, so my name is David Trout. I'm the Natural Resources Director for the Nisqually Indian Tribe, and I've been in that position since 1987. I was hired by Willie's dad, uh, Billy Frank, to come run the, his program and protect and restore the Nisqually watershed. And I've been doing that now for 34 years working for the tribe, um, and I'm loving every minute of it. We've been working on salmon recovery in the Nisqually for a long time. And, and by the way, I'm not going to be using a PowerPoint. This is just sort of a fireside chat and uh, it's sort of a mellow discussion around salmon recovery and then hope to get into some questions. Um, but I'm going to hit a couple of issues here that are critical that we're doing in the Nisqually that I think and hope you'll find interesting. So um, again, we've been working on salmon recovery for a long time in the Nisqually. Soon after the famous Bolt decision, U.S. v. Washington, that court case back in 1974 that reaffirmed the tribe's treaty rights and allocated the resources 50-50 between the tribes and the state, uh, soon after that, Billy Frank, as our fisheries manager at Nisqually, wrote a plan in 1977 that he distributed to the community. His vision for now that we've won in the courts, what do we do on the watershed? And at the time, the Nisqually was not in good shape. We had two hydroelectric projects operating in ways that were not safe for fish. We had lost a bunch of main stem habitat and the river was in, not in a good environmental shape. And in fact, in 1977, we had a copper oil, copper ore spill from a train crossing in Yelm that killed all the fish downstream for many, many miles. And so that prompted Billy to, to write this plan that still sits on my desk today and is still our, our guideline for what we're going to do. And the main point there was to protect and restore the home for the fish. So that when they've done all that they do in their journey through life and through the oceans and through avoiding predation and catch and make it back to the spawning grounds, he wanted to be sure that they had cool, clean water and, and the right kinds of gravel to spawn in. So uh, that's something we've been working on for a long time. And a key to that 
is um, recognizing that as a tribe, we can't do it alone. And so we needed to develop a community and we really needed to develop a community associated with the Nisqually watershed. So uh, in 1987, we formed um, through legislative oversight, formed the Nisqually River Council. It's the oldest watershed council west of the Mississippi. I'm proud to be its chair for the last 15 years. And we've been working on all Nisqually, all kinds of Nisqually issues over these past 30 plus years, um, including salmon recovery. And what was unique about the Nisqually is that we did get started early and we got started not in the face of ESA or declining salmon populations or orca populations on the brink. We formed because we wanted to manage the Nisqually holistically and differently and retain local control. And so we were able to, over a number of years, develop critical relationships with our state agency friends, our federal agency friends, and our neighbors along the watershed, so that when critical issues did come up, like the listing of Puget Sound Chinook in 1999, including the Nisqually, and soon thereafter the Nisqually Steelhead, the Watershed Council turned to the Nisqually tribe and said, lead us through this. And so there wasn't a lot of fighting there wasn't a lot of negotiation that needed to take place. We had a community organized and supportive. The trust had been built and they turned to my program to lead them through this. So we developed a recovery plan. Uh, we had been working on it for a number of years because we could see the writing on the wall that ESA was going to be um, applied in Puget Sound. So we started recovery planning in 1996, three years ahead of the listing. The listing came out in January of 1999. And by October of 1999, we had adopted our first recovery plan in the Nisqually. And the federal government didn't get around to adopting it until 2006, but we weren't going to wait around for them. One of Billy's adages that I live by still is if you want to be in charge, act like you're in charge. And we are in charge of the Nisqually. So we wrote the recovery plan and we started putting it into, into place and to start taking action. And some of those actions that we described in the recovery plan um, are linked to um, ways to evaluate our progress, metrics. So we established goals that we wanted to hit on various key things for salmon, starting with the estuary. We wanted to restore 900 acres in the Nisqually Delta, restore it to functioning quality again. We wanted to protect the main stem Nisqually and restore the few tributaries that we have that support salmon in the Nisqually. And, and so we've been working on those, chipping away at it day after day, month after month, year after year, and making some pretty significant progress. And I'm going to go over a couple of those, those things for us. But we've been talking a lot tonight about, and appropriately so, the connection between salmon and orcas. And in particular, as you've been following the presentations, the Nisqually salmon is one of those key populations in South Sound, really critical for the long-term recovery of these orca populations. Well, if Willie were here tonight, he would also tell you there's another real serious consideration and concern, and that is for the tribe's treaty rights, and that uh, the tribe's treaty rights are linked to fishing and being on the Nisqually River and catching the salmon as they come back. And for nearly 15,000 years, they did that successfully and sustainably. But just in the past 30 to 40 years, we've seen changes occurring in Puget Sound and in the ocean with climate change and ocean acidification and, and an ecosystem in flux uh, to the point that our salmon populations in the Nisqually are moving in the wrong direction. When I started in 1987, we were fishing 105 days a year sustainably. Um, by 2015, that had been reduced to eight days. And as Willie likes to say, being on the Nisqually River is like being in church. And so not being able to be on the river and, and fish and not being able to practice their traditional values and culture uh, has long lasting impacts. And so there's a tremendous urgency that we can't see our fishing time go any less. If it goes from eight to four to one, uh, the tribe loses its connection to the river, to salmon, to its culture, and the treaty becomes meaningless. And we can't let that happen. So we're working hard to make progress. And so if you start at the, the heart of the Nisqually River in the estuary, and if you've had a chance to drive over I-5 at a high tide and see Puget Sound lapping up against I-5, that's the result of a lot of partners working together, including the Nisqually Indian Tribe and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, to over a period of about 15 years, starting small on some property the tribe purchased 
from the Braggett family down in the Nisqually Delta. Um, acre by acre, we started with five acres, went to 10 acres, and then another 20, and then 110 on our side of the river. And then ultimately the big restoration on the Fish and Wildlife Service side of the river to where we now have over 900 acres restored, nearly 90% of the function of the estuary returned, and it is the largest single fully restored estuary north of San Francisco. And we're really proud of that. And it supports fish not only from the Nisqually, but 25% of the fish that we sample out there during our monitoring are from other watersheds, from the Puyallup, from the Green, from as far away as the Snohomish. So the work that we've done there not only bolsters our population of Chinook salmon in the Nisqually, but Chinook salmon throughout the region. And so that benefits not only us, but fishing communities up and down the coast and the Southern resident killer whales as well. Another key part of our plan was to protect and restore the main stem Nisqually. We have two hydroelectric projects on the Nisqually, one operated by the city of Centralia at River Mile 26 and a project complex operated by the Tacoma Power, city of Tacoma at River Mile 45. The one at River Mile 45 is a complete blockage to fish migration and may have been a natural blockage as well, although it's possible Spring Chinook may have made it beyond that particular part of the river. The Centralia project is not a blocking um, project. It does have fish passage, although the history of that is quite remarkable and, and could, uh, I could give another presentation just on the FERC issues that we've had to, to deal with to get them to be suitable, but they're in a current state where they are safe for adults and safe for juveniles. And so when you're looking at the main stem to Squally, it's really 42 miles of river, 84 miles of riparian right bank and left bank, and our plan is to protect 90% of it in long-term stewardship agreements. When we started down this path in 1989 of protecting the Nisqually by forming the Nisqually Land Trust, we had about 3% of the main stem in permanent stewardship. And that was really the refuge and the Nisqually Indian Reservation. But through the work of the tribe and the land trust and a bunch of other partners and our private land owners and neighbors along the watershed, we're now pushing 80% of the main stem Nisqually is in permanent stewardship. I can't think of another river system, perhaps in the world, but certainly in the world that we live in around here, that has had that kind of amazing restoration and protection work occur in a relatively short amount of time. It seems like a long time as I've spent my career doing it, but ultimately it's only seven or eight salmon life cycles, which is really not a lot of time. And then as we're working upstream there, we have two tributaries that support Chinook salmon and we're working hard to restore those as well. And they've been impacted by agricultural conversions of wetlands and re of channeling the floodplains and also from timber practices in, this, in the past that have not been uh, suitable for salmon habitat. So working on Ohop Creek and restoring Ohop and on the Michelle, restoring the complexity in the Michelle we're getting to the point where we're making real significant progress in the Nisqually, in our restoration efforts, and yet we're still not seeing the benefits come back of the fish. And that really has to do with a lot of things that Jacques was talking about in his presentation. Now, once the fish leave the Nisqually River, they're subject to all those things that Jacques was talking about in terms of ocean survival, marine survival. And our fish have to go through Puget Sound and through the Strait of Georgia and around Vancouver Island twice as juveniles going out and as adults coming back and are experiencing all those negative issues from food supply to maybe not timing well with their out migration to increased predation from whether it's the northern population of killer whales to the harbor seals and sea lions that are abundant in the Salish Sea. Um, our fish are experiencing all those things. And so we are hanging on by our fingernails in the Nisqually waiting for um, and working on improving conditions so that these fish can survive. The last two uh, in-river things I want to talk about real quickly are the big kind of projects that we're working on, the kind of projects that really uh, change systems. And you may have heard me talk about this in the past, that the construction of I-5 across the Nisqually Delta in the late 1950s and early 1960s was built on piers and allowed the river to move naturally underneath the piers. But in the early to mid 1960s, as a result of concern for maintenance costs, 
that entire crossing in the Nisqually Delta, except for the river and McAllister Creek and a couple of small flood channels, completely diked and filled. And so where we talk about having basically two hydro projects, two dams on the Nisqually, in reality, we have three. I-5 is the lowest dam on the Nisqually River and blocks habitat values and functions from being fully restored in the Nisqually Deltas. And with climate change and sea level rise, we're seeing that the work that we've done there, the largest restoration on the West Coast, north of Frisco, is being challenged by uh, increasing sea level uh, levels and temperature. And so we need to resolve that issue for fish. And what we've also noticed in doing some other work is that I-5 itself is under threat. That the Nisqually River across from Frank's Landing Community, the Wahilut Indian School, has been shifting over the last 30 years to the point where it is now flowing upstream. And as you might guess, a river doesn't generally like to flow upstream. It's going to work hard to keep going downstream. And the only way it can go downstream uh, in its current configuration is going to be going through I-5 away from the bridges um, underneath the Nisqually River, but more directed towards the wetlands on the Pierce County side. And so we did some work with the USGS to determine within the next 17 to 20 years, uh, I-5 will be threatened by the Nisqually River. Now, what we couldn't determine through our work is whether or not uh, a major flood event could come through and create an avulsion event and take out I-5 at any point. This atmospheric river that's coming through tonight has me worried. Our reservoir is in good shape, but things change quickly. And if we have a significant flood like we had back in 1996, uh, I might not be able to get to work tomorrow. And many of you may not be able to travel through South Sound. And so this is a critical issue that needs to be resolved quickly. We've got the attention of the legislature and Department of Transportation. I'm proud to announce we just signed a co-management agreement, an MOU with the Washington State Department of Transportation on the management of that effort. And I'm sure and I'm certain that within the next, say, seven to 10 years, we'll be constructing a new crossing across the Nisqually Delta for I-5 that will restore the natural um, habitat values and restore salmon and protect treaty rights and things like southern resident killer whales as well. Finally, the last big thing we're working on that I think really could be applied across the region is that we have seen over time since I started a shift in our timberland ownership patterns where we no longer have big single block ownerships, but where we now have multiple ownerships operated by investment trusts out of Wall Street with a completely different relationship to the land. Again, when I started in 87, Weyerhaeuser was the largest landowner in the Nisqually watershed, probably the largest landowner in Western Washington. They, are, they no longer have a presence in the Nisqually watershed. They've sold off all their lands and they're owned by multiple investment groups and managed by multiple investment groups. And so where Weyerhaeuser as a family company had a hundred year vision and a hundred year plans for its lands, these investment groups have 10 year plans. They have to show net gain at Wall Street on their investments or they lose the ability to manage the lands and there are tax consequences for the way these things are established as well. So um, the, there's a, a massive disconnect now between the current management of timberlands and the Nisqually and ultimately salmon recovery. And the key issue is that we are harvesting trees at a very early age. And what we've found through the science is that early age trees, trees less than 60 years old, act like straws and suck water out of the watersheds and throw it up into the air and affect primarily summer stream flows, which is really critical for salmon. Um, particularly in the Nisqually. And with climate change changing snowpack conditions, um, we need to have as much water in the streams as possible. And our modeling shows, well, if we could simply go to 60 to 80 year old rotations, at that age, the trees actually retain water into the system. And so where in August, the Michelle River up in the upper Nisqually is flowing at about two to three cubic feet per second through Edenville, and goes dry, completely dry at the mouth of the Nisqually, and the Chinook have to wait for the rain before they can enter. If we were able to change the management of the Michelle Basin timber and create older stands of timber, we could add 12 to 15 cubic feet per second of water in the Michelle River during the summer, just in that action alone. And that would result in um, 
year-round access for salmon, juveniles and adults to the Michelle River. No longer would it go subsurface at the mouth. The real path forward to deal with this issue in my mind is not going to be through a regulatory change and not trying to browbeat the industry into doing something different. It's, that's just gonna take too long with an uncertain future. We think the best way to do it is to buy the land like we did along the main stem of Nisqually to protect, buy timberlands and turn them into a community forest and manage them for multiple benefits and multiple values. And we're doing that. The Nisqually tribe and the land trust just recently acquired almost 3000 acres of land that we added to our community forest, which is now about 6,000 acres in total. Our target is 50,000 acres over time. And I'm confident we'll get there and I'm confident it's gonna make a big difference for salmon and steelhead in the Nisqually River. Now, before I wrap up, and I know I'm running late and I apologize for that, I wanna hit on a couple of other issues because salmon recovery is this integration of all these different kinds of factors that are affecting salmon from restoration and protection of habitat to how we manage our hatcheries and our harvest to support recovery. And I wanna hit on those last two real quickly, that in the Nisqually, we are looking at experimentally changing the way we raise hatchery fish to deal with some of the issues that Jock talked about with these releases that go out in a week or two within May, and they all come back within a week or two in August, and the diversity is gone, the ability to support southern rivers and killer whales is challenged. We're experimenting with changing that and restoring more of a natural sense of life history diversity to Nisqually hatchery fish. And we're also dealing with the issue that Brad addressed in his presentation, and that is the diminishing size of Chinook salmon in Puget Sound. We've seen the average just in the last 20 years go from 17 pounds to under 11 pounds. Our Chinook are more like coho now than they are like Chinook, and that's a real problem for things like southern resident killer whales. So we're taking on an experiment, and we've been doing it now for three years. This is our fourth season where we are intentionally spawning the largest fish we can get our hands on in the hatchery to see if we can make these fish larger larger and older. Our Chinook salmon are almost predominantly three-year-old fish now, where they used to be three, four, five, and even six-year-old fish. And so we're hopeful through our release strategies that are gonna to change to more mimic natural conditions. And this large on large to increase the size of these fish will introduce more variability into our populations that'll better support things like Southern resident killer whales and better support in a sustainable way, our tribal fisheries. And then in terms of our tribal fishery, the last thing I wanna talk about is that uh, the Nisqually tribe um, has one of the few remaining traditional in-river gillnet fisheries left. We basically fish only in the Nisqually River and McAllister Creek, which is adjacent to it. I have maybe two or three fishermen that wander into Puget Sound occasionally, but we are an in-river fishery. And so we are experimenting with techniques to allow us to increase the harvest on our hatchery fish and to decrease harvest on our natural recovering population in the Nisqually. And we've looked at things like tangle nets and potentially fish traps. But what we're beginning to find is that if we simply use our current gill net gear, but implement it in a way to release fish by getting the fish out quickly, the survival out of this gear type in the river under real world conditions is like 99%. We've lost, I think, two fish in the last three years during this experiment. So we're hopeful that our fishermen will embrace the idea that we can use our traditional gear and have to release one out of every 10 or 12 fish as a wild fish to keep fishing, to catch more hatchery fish. And so we're integrating our approach with harvest and hatcheries and habitat to try to better produce a sustainable fisheries resource to benefit my tribe and my tribal members, but also all the fishing communities, all the tribes that depend on our fish and things like southern resident killer whales that depend on our Chinook salmon as well. And so with that, um, I'm certainly available to answer questions. And um, again, I thank you for your time. Great, thank you, David. Thank you, Tara, thank you, Jacques. We will go ahead and bring our speakers back for a little bit of a Q&A. So we do have a few questions in the Q&A that I'll ask. Um, and if anybody has more questions, please feel free to write those in there. So the first question, um, I guess we can just open up to anybody who might have the answer on this, but are humpbacks having a significant impact on herring stocks as well as other species they prey on? 
since we have such an increase in humpback fear. Anybody know the answer to that? I'm tapping out, I don't know that one. I think that might need to be a Brad Hansen question or answer, yeah, Q&A for him. All right, we'll include that in our list of questions. I, I would just that. say that it's bigger than it used to be. <laughs> That's pretty safe because there are more of them. Uh, but you know, whether it's significant. Right, and, and maybe I would add Jacques that uh, I think the demise that we're seeing in our herring populations and the prey base is more a result of loss of habitat in Puget Sound, uh, likely than an increase in predation by other, other species. All right, thank you. Uh, so the next question, there's two that I'm going to kind of combine here for Jacques, has to do with seal predation. Uh, part one is, is anyone looking at the effect seals have by also preying on fish which prey on juvenile salmon? And part two of that is, uh, how often do you think removal of nearby human made haulouts instead of the individual animals would suffice for reducing the pressure from the targeted pinnipeds? Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna take a whack at the first one and then ask you to ask the second one again. Um, so. So uh, the short answer is no, um, but the but the modeling um, the modeling does indicate. A, I mean, when when you see numbers like forty percent of the um, Chinook and and fifty percent of the coho being removed by harbor seals in the Strait of Georgia, those are those are really really high numbers. Um, so I, I, you know, I. I I, I don't know. You'd have to model it. You'd have to say what were the what were the the population numbers of dogfish or, um, uh, hake or or Pacific cod that might be might have been in Puget Sound at some time in the past when seals were less abundant, um, and fisheries on those species were less abundant. I mean, fisheries pretty much wiped those those fish out. It wasn't seals or sea lions as I understand it. It was a it was really intense fisheries on those marine fish populations that were that were considered the principal uh, impact. Um, so I don't know. When, and, the, and, and what is the second question again? So I'll read it in its entirety. It was in, in experimental removals that come to your mind as first highest priority possibilities. How often do you think removal of nearby human made haulouts instead of the individual animals would suffice for reducing the pressure from the targeted pinnipeds? Um, David may be able to answer this as well as I, as I can because some of the places that this comes to mind are near the Nisqually Basin. You know, there, there was a bunch of um, log booms in the Woodard Bay area near the Nisqually that was part of a, part of a DNR um, uh, aquatic reserve area that were not removed because they provided hab, uh, habitat for harbor seals. And that was, there was a very, very large population there. It's not very far, far from the mouth of the Nisqually River. Secondly, there's a, a I believe there's a large barge that's uh, derelict in the mouth of the Nisqually River that is a haul out area for sea lions. And both of those uh, artificial structures were providing a lot of um, easy access and resting areas for pinniped predators on adult and juvenile salmon and steelhead very near the mouth of the river, which was a pinch point. Um, we've been working with David's um, tribe to um, deploy and, and Ocean's Initiative to deploy an acoustic startle device at the mouth of the river to see if that is deterring um, some predation behavior. But um, again, I think I think we we will. Um, I, I think the Nisqually would be a great place to try to do an experiment like that. I don't know how you, I mean, what you'd have to do is to put out the, um, you know, put out the devices and then remove the, and then have the animals there and then remove the devices and have the animals there and then remove the animals and put the devices back. I mean, it, it, to think about the controls for that kind of experiment would be pretty complicated. All right, thank you. Uh, so the next one, I think, was for Tara. Uh, you show hood canal chum as healthier than many other stocks. Has more chum hatcheries been considered in Puget Sound? 
I do not know the answer to that question, Jock. Do you know if I, I, I mean, I tend to say no, but I, uh, you might know yes, more than I David, do. David may know more about that than I do um, because he's involved in fisheries management and, and um, HGMP development. David, do you, do you know, are there any plans for chum hatcheries in Puget Sound right now? Yeah, there's a lot of discussion going on now about that, um, but I think we're taking a very cautious approach to it. In South Sound, we typically have, although the recent trend has not been very good, um, a really strong wild chum population that we really don't want to uh, enter any risk into their survival. Um, the last three years, the runs have been down, but this year it appears to be coming back very strong. And in mm -hmm. fact, our test fishery that, that went on today seem to indicate that there are lots of chum salmon out there. Um, there are pluses and minuses to all these kind of actions and proposals. And so building hatcheries for chum salmon um, could potentially bolster some populations, but then you have the potential impact of having a bunch of smolts go out at the same time and attracting and supporting pinniped predation, seal predation that then will predate on steelhead and chinook. And so, it, as we're beginning to learn more about Puget Sound and how we need to restore it, we're really learning how complicated it is and that there is no one thing or silver bullet that's going to do the job, but it's really a combination of a lot of different things. And, and hatcheries, in my mind, can be really successful and useful in supporting harvest if done the right way, but they can also have negative consequences. So we have to be really thoughtful about that. So I can just, um, I'm, I'm, um, um, member of the U.S. delegation to the North Pacific Anadromous Fish Commission, which looks at salmon in the open Pacific Ocean beyond the EEZ. And one of the concerns that, that continues to come up there is the potential oversubscription of the Pacific Ocean with hatchery fish, largely from Japan, Russia, and Alaska. Alaska produces, even though they have a lot of great habitat up there, they, they really ma maximize their salmon production by sticking hatcheries every place where there isn't a really healthy salmon run. And so for example, if there's a waterfall or something that dumps right into the marine environment, they'll say, well, there's a freshwater supply. There's no, there's no salmon run there. Let's take that fresh water, run it through a hatchery and produce a hatchery run there. And then they'll have a wipeout fishery uh, that for the salmon that come back every year and just collect enough to put in the hatchery and sell the rest. Um, tying this, so there's two, there's, 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 Alaska has taken a very aggressive approach to that. They have very, very high supplementation of their wild fisheries with hatcheries. Um, and it's an economic model that is currently working for them, at least in the short run. Tying this question to an earlier question, there also has been evidence of places where they have these large chum and pink hatcheries in Alaska, where humpback whales have figured out when the release timing is for those fish and they patrol the hatchery um, opening when the fish come out and, and eat quite a bit of the production of juvenile uh, hatchery fish. So <laughs> it's kind of a complicated system. I mean, we, we've talked about, long with the Kings has a hatchery on Orcas Island where we grow Chinook and we have some challenges with that. Um, it's, a, it's, it, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a challenge uh, and we're working through that. And some of the challenges are based on climate change and the fact that there are there are higher densities of noxic, noxious algae in the system when the fish go out and come back um, related to eutrophication and or warmer water and or different oceanographic conditions. And so we're trying to mitigate that. One idea we've had is to start a, a chum run there um, that may be more successful because of the timing when they go out uh, and come back. Um, I would caution us though, one of the species of salmon in the Puget Sound Basin that is actually close to recovery are summer chum in Hood Canal. And we wouldn't want to do any, that, that is a success story and, and it's, they're, they're getting close to recovery, if not meeting recovery goals. So that might be the first salmon species on the West Coast or salmon run on the West Coast that's delisted from the Federal Endangered Species Act. And sort of echoing what David said, we want to be very careful and, and, and Tara as well, we want to be very careful how we approach enhanced hatchery production. Long answer. Right. And, and, and I don't necessarily think that chum would be, is the limiting factor for southern resident killer whale. I think targeting Chinook in Puget Sound um, would be a higher priority. 
All right, thank you. For hatchery fish, at least. So uh, this next one could be for anybody, and I'm going to kind of combine two of them. One of them uh, was from a student studying resource conservation at the University of Montana, uh, wondering how to get involved with all the conservation of salmon in the area uh, and orcas. And then the other one is kind of similar to that. What are some things we can tell the average person on how they can help Chinook salmon and what kind of volunteer opportunities are there? I'll, I'll let I'll let David and, and Tara take a, a, a whack at that and I'll back clean up. <laughs> okay. There won't be anything to clean up though after they're done, I'm sure. Maybe I'll start with a very specific watershed uh, view. There are um, Nisqually River Council-like organizations throughout Puget Sound and throughout the state of Washington. Uh, they're called lead entities and they organize the local communities to get engaged in salmon recovery. And it's this bottom up approach that we use in the state of Washington where we've got local communities driving the priorities, working with their neighbors to implement salmon recovery. And so there are opportunities in each one of our watersheds for individuals to get involved. And it's just a matter of, of going to the website, perhaps at the Governor's Salmon Recovery Office to see what's available there. And then Nisqually, if you go to NisqualyRiver.org um, and look there, there'll be tons of opportunities for volunteers to get engaged and get out on the, get out on the rivers. We do river planting or tree planting and blackberry removal and all kinds of stuff that really is dependent on having a strong volunteer group. The, the other thing I would suggest that anybody can do is to contact their elected officials and tell them how important this is. Uh, I think as Tara said, we have struggled for years to get the resources necessary to solve the problems that we're trying to deal with at the level of the problems that they were created. And so 20% of the identified need for salmon recovery, more or less every year, means you're falling behind all the time. And one of the things you fall behind in is that a lot of these landowners who may be willing now to enter into agreements and restore properties uh, change hands and that dynamic shifts. And so windows of opportunity to solve salmon recovery open and close, and we've got to be able to take advantage of it. And our current funding stream doesn't allow us to do that. So if you were to contact the governor's office and contact your local elected officials and tell them how important salmon recovery is to you and your family and your community, that can make a huge difference. They don't hear enough about that. Tara, do you want to continue? Yeah, I just, yeah, I just want to put a plug in. I mean, I did show that slide with all that funding coming into the state um, for salmon recovery, and it's going out on the ground. And so another organization, another group of organizations to think about are the regional fisheries enhancement groups. They have major volunteer efforts and collectives, and they are out on the ground doing habitat restorations all the time. And there's 14 of them throughout the state. So chances are you might find one um, in your location. And so you can just Google regional fisheries enhancement groups. And same with land trusts. They do a lot of tree plantings and, um, and work to do um, habitat restoration. And then um, we just had a really successful Orca Day, Orca Day event organized by conservation districts in partnership with many nonprofits and counties and cities throughout the state. Um, and actually throughout the whole Northwest. And so that happens every October and that's a great way to meet people and tap into to other organizations. Um, and so, yeah, I encourage um, people to get involved with some of those folks and uh, get out on the ground and help with habitat restoration. And then if you contact me, I can give you a whole host of other ideas. Can I just do one other quick thing? So um, the student asked you, you know, how they can get involved. If you wanna work in this field, my, my my initial comment is is get involved in an internship. I mean, we at Long with the Kings, we have a small staff. We only have about 13 staff on payroll. And then we have a couple of contract workers that work with us. Um, we've hired about 50% of the interns that have come through here on as, as permanent staff. You know, so you get involved with an organization like ours or like like um, the state or like the Nisqually tribe or one of the one of the lead entities, and you demonstrate that you are effective. And it's a lot, it's a lot easier to, to hire somebody you know than it is to hire somebody you don't know. So I know it could take an economic hit and, and it may be a struggle for a while, but um, that seems to be a formula that's working for folks. If I could add one more thing, it's about, again, the elected official side. 
Um, we heard from the governor today at a meeting with our tribal leadership that uh, he's working on a package for salmon recovery. It's gonna be a bold, aggressive package. It should be out to the public sometime in December to be able to see. And for it to get to the finish line, for us to see the kind of action that the governor's ready to move on is gonna require all of us in the public supporting it. And so again, please find ways to reach out to your local elected official and tell them how important it is. Get a hold of the governor's office, get a hold of Tara and ask, hey, can we see that package? We're really interested in it. There are lots of ways to help, help this effort. There is a fantastic salmon recovery network in Washington state. And this night is really exciting to bring together the orca folks with the salmon recovery um, act, you know, efforts going on in the state. And it, it feels like a, a whole new family and it's, it's yeah, we, we need you. Great, thanks so much, all of you. Um, I apologize for not being able to get to everybody's questions. I know we're running a little late, but really appreciate all of you being here and talking about the work that you're doing and answering these great questions. So thank you all so very, very much. My yeah, pleasure, thank you. thank you. Good seeing you, Jacques, good seeing you, Tara. Good seeing you. Yeah. Good night, everyone. All right, so we are going to uh, finish up with some videos, some wonderful videos. So hopefully you'll all stay on to watch those. The first one is uh, some prey sharing videos from the Center for Whale Research. So Dr. Michael Weiss uh, recorded these with a drone under permit for the Center for Whale Research and uh, University of Exeter. The first one was from 2019 and it involves little J56 Tofino when she was just a little one. Uh, and some other whales doing some prey sharing. I won't give it away because Michael does a great job narrating it. The second video uh, was just recorded very recently, just this year, and it involves J58 with kind of a little surprising prey sharing happening there. So again, uh, Michael will narrate it and let you know exactly what you're seeing. But the, the second video, I just want to say that this is hot off the press. Uh, we just got it a couple of days ago from Michael. So you are among the first people to actually be able to see this. So hope you enjoy it. So in this video, we have a few of our kind of best of 2019 uh, drone video. Um, in this first one, we have three individuals. So we have the biggest whale that you see here is J47 and the two smaller whales are J53 and J56. And J56 was less than a year old, and J53 is a few years old. Um, so these whales are not super closely related. Um, they are all within J-pod, but they're not um, you know, direct relatives. Um, but we still kind of have, it almost seems like a little bit of babysitting going on here. Um, J56's mother, J50, uh, J31 rather, is not in the frame currently. Uh, we didn't actually know where she was when we were filming this, but here she comes up from the deep and you can actually see she has a fish in her mouth. And she's joined by J46, another J17 whale. Um, so she comes up with this fish. J56 is clearly very, very interested. Um, and she actually bites the fish in half right about there. Uh, leaves some of it behind that uh, J46 goes for, along with J53. Uh, J47 continues following, uh, kind of maybe hoping for some extra scraps. So that's potentially an example of reciprocation of, of the babysitting with, um, with some food sharing. So this is a video of um, some J-pod whales off of Limekiln. You can actually see the Limekiln Lighthouse there um, in September of this year, 2021. We'd been with these, this general group for a while, kind of watching them forage and prey share, and we, uh, we picked up this group. So you see here, um, there's two whales chasing a fish right in front of them there that we're pretty sure is a Chinook salmon. That's J51 and uh, J58. So two, the two J41 uh, kids there. Uh, and that adult closer to the front is actually not their mom, uh, J41. That's actually J22, another J-pod whale who's not actually that closely related. So we have three whales here kind of... It's unclear if they're, you know, really coordinating and working together to catch this fish, but they're certainly all going for the same fish. Um, J58 there is, you know, a, a real youngster, potentially uh, not as experienced. Um, it, it almost looks like, you know, she's, she's kind of messing things up a little bit. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so so J58 and J, J51, they're, they're siblings. They seem to have a, a really close, you know, tactile relationship, even in the midst of hunting, which should potentially be a bit more, uh, a bit, a bit more serious for them. So yeah, the, the salmon has just disappeared kind of off screen. They're all kind of moving for it. J51 taking the lead there uh, with J58 close behind and J22 kind of hanging off to the side. Um, so they're all going for it. Obviously, J22 is a lot more experienced. She's a much older whale, and she's, you know, an adult female. She has her own son who is foraging offshore of them. There, she just did a lunge, and when you next see her, she'll have the fish in her mouth. There it is. Um, and she'll do something really cool here, which is she's going to uh, break the fish in half and share it with with these other two whales and i want to say again these are not super close relatives obviously pods are kind of extended families but at least in the northern residents most of the sharing happens within matrilines and these whales are not part of the same matriline um and actually a, a pattern we're starting to see emerge in the southern residents is that prey sharing seems to be a lot more spread out at least in j pod so j51 now has a piece of the fish that he, he kind of drops we don't know how much of it he actually ate and uh, j58 is kind of just trailing trailing behind J-22 there, uh, maybe hoping to get a few more scraps. So yeah, this kind of um, more dispersed prey sharing we're seeing in, in J-Pod, um, we still need to kind of get our data together and analyze it, but that seems to be a pattern. And um, it, it, it may kind of be reflected in the fact that, you know, the pods in the southern residents are a lot more cohesive. They've kind of stayed stable, whereas the pods in the northern residents have kind of broken down. with some food sharing. Thanks everyone at Orca Network for the invitation today to talk about uh, Southern Resident Killer Whale Diet and Prey. So we'll be coming back in just a moment with one more video, so just stay tuned. Go ahead. All right, this uh, video coming up is from Florian Graner, and it is just an amazingly clear, close look at the salmon and other fish in the Elwha River. And the whole story, uh, Florian narrates it beautifully and tells the story of the revitalizing of the Elwha River after the dams were removed. Uh, it's a beautiful story, it's, and he is uh, a PhD in fisheries and is very aware of the, uh, the, the whole picture, the whole biological web of life that is coming back to life in the, in the Elwha River. Um, so let's go ahead and run it. It's amazing. Feast your eyes. And again, this is a, a first ever presentation of this video that Florian just completed for us yesterday. <laughs> so it's a beauty. Since the removal of the two Elva dams, to this date the largest dam removal in US history, the development of salmon runs in this pristine Olympic Mountains River have been of great interest, not only nationally, but also internationally. It truly is a pioneer project in many ways. So how are the Alva salmon doing? As always, there is not one single answer. First of all, it is important to recognize that the river is home not only to what some might consider the biggest prize, the king of Sailor Sea King Salmon, the Tai, traditionally Elva River Chinook, larger than 100 pounds. There are coho, pink, chum, 
and sockeye salmon, as well as winter and summer steelhead, and some bull trout, which also navigate from the sea into the Elbe to spawn. For all of these species, the removal of the dams has provided access to miles of pristine riverbeds, which had been denied to them for a century. Their responses have been diverse and varied. Rainbow trout truly went off once the dams came down. In the 2008 survey, 3,218 were counted. The total in 2019 was nearly 25,000. A survey in 2019 counted more than 340 summer steelhead, non-existent before the dam removal. Their very existence today is explained by formerly landlocked rainbow trout, once again exploring the bounty of the ocean before returning to their home river, the Elbe. The endangered bull trout also more than doubled in counts, taken before and after the dam removal. As for Chinook, their numbers have steadily increased since the removal of the dams. It is a real joy to see them in the river, sharing pool with a variety of other salmonids, other species of salmon and trout, even some Dolly Varden trout, a relative of the Arctic chop. Differences in size and shape very quickly become apparent. Yes, there is more to Elva Chinook than meets the eye. Their gene pool is less blended than the ones from salmon of any other river entering the Sailor Sea watershed except for the Dungeness River. Years of dwindling salmon runs have led to human interventions, mostly in form of salmon hatchery. Often, the salmon used in hatcheries were not native to the river they were released in, leading to a blending of genes, reducing the diverse gene pool the salmon of this region once boasted. Not so for Elva Chinook. While most of the king salmon returning to the river today are hatchery fish, they are descended from Elva Chinook, used in a state hatchery program since the 1930s. Elva Chinook have been seen far upstream past the rapids through Glines Canyon and Goblins Gate into the pristine upper reaches of the Olympic National Park. But that development has not taken off as rapidly as some imagined, leaving some open questions. Still, in 2016, after the final removal of a rockfall which collapsed into the river channel just days after the Glines Canyon Dam came down, blocking fish passage again, a red was counted just a little downstream from the confluence with Godkin Creek, nearly 36 miles up the river. Before the dam removals, the fish had all but five miles of Lower Elva to produce the next generation. The tall barriers had no fish passage. One theory is that hatchery salmon have not been used to navigate the length of the river, and it might take longer than estimated to produce a king salmon closer to the original Chinook, utilizing the full potential of the river. Mike McHenry, habitat biologist for the Lower Elva Clallam tribe, thinks the historic upriver stock was likely spring run and is extinct in the river today. The hatchery fish, which were used to keep Elva Chinook alive, were from summer Chinook, which may never have ventured as far up the river in the past. He also thinks that abundance of fish in the river matters and that when spawning beds become highly contested, fish are forced to seek less populated areas further up the river. With summer steelhead and bull trout it is a different story. With the least human intervention, these fish have recolonized the river almost all the way to its headwaters, 
and increased in abundance. Still, returns of adult Chinook in the Elva River are the highest since the late 1980s. After the removal of the lower Elva Dam in 2012, 209 reds were counted. In 2014, after the demolition of the Grimes Canyon Dam, red counts were up to 1,349. And in 2019, 1,673 reds were recorded, with an estimated 7,600 Chinook in the river. The 2020 and 2021 counts are still to be released. Sam Brankman, chief fisheries biologist of the Olympic National Park, admits this is still a modest count, but he notes the Elva represents one of the only watersheds in Puget Sound with such an uptick in numbers. And the further development looks promising. The Elva could be one of those stories in which parents can truly say to their children, you are going to catch much more fish in this river than I was ever able to catch. That is an encouraging thought. But there are also worries. Increasing pressure to open the fishing in the river too soon might dampen the recovery as well as effects of climate change with reduced summer water flows and rising temperatures. Both not favorable for the development of cold and clear water loving salmonids. But for the time being there is scientific consensus. The Alva River is recovering and provides an excellent example of ecosystem restoration. Sam Brankman expects a full salmon recovery to take at least 20 to 30 years. The fishery has been halted for 10 years now, since 2011, to help the salmon recovery. The vision guiding recovery is a fish population robust enough to support itself, not relying on supplements from hatcheries. Rebuilding a naturally reproducing Elva Chinook run poses a significant challenge. There are five stages to the recovery program. Preservation, recolonization, local adaption, and establishment of viable naturally spawning populations. So far, the salmon recovery in the Elva is still in its infancy. The preservation of fragile fish runs through the process of dam removal which released 100 years worth of sediments trapped behind these barriers. The sediment has mostly reached the sea by now and is reviving the near shore ecology there. In the river, the second phase, recolonization, has just begun. With the first autumn storms on the horizon, to the sound of rutting elk, yellow maple leaves floating down the clear river, Chinook salmon work their way up the river once again for the business of reproduction. The once silvery fish morph into colorful monsters worthy of a Halloween costume using all their stored body energy to master the river and to produce eggs and sperm without ever feasting again. And only when the last red is duck, when the eggs are laid, the sperm released, the exhausted fish lay down to die, fertilizing the river and surrounding areas far upstream. A precious cycle comes to an end. Weeks later, almost like a phoenix rising from the ashes, young salmon hatch from the riverbed. These elven larvae stay in the gravel until they have used up the yolk sac. When they finally emerge into the river, they are called fry. They feed and dwell in their home river, becoming par, developing their characteristic vertical bends. Then they start to group and get ready to journey downstream. 
Young Chinook may take one to two years until they leave their native stream, using nearshore habitats such as eelgrass meadows and kelp beds for cover before they are ready to head out into the Pacific to enter the bounty of the ocean food chain. Endangered southern resident orcas already have been seen prowling the Strait of Juan de Fuca near the mouth of the Elba, just as the big kings are beginning to return to the river. They depend on a steady supply of these salmon to survive. Many more dams will have to be removed, especially up the Columbia and Snake River, where the big numbers of salmon were formerly produced to ensure the endurance of these iconic whales. Oh, that is just an incredible video. Um, and we appreciate Orion getting that together for us. Um, and I believe he is still with us. And um, I know we're running late, but um, I think we are able to maybe unmute you if you want to just say a word or two about that amazing video and um, the work you've done with Ken Balcom in the Elwa um, and that just incredible film. Cindy's going to try to find you and unmute you. <laughs> <laughs> there. And he moves his video. <laughs> Uh, can you actually see me? No, uh, no we, we see Gina's name. <laughs> uh, you can hear me. No, we, we can, can hear, hear you fine, yes. Well, that's a start. Um, I don't see the video button um, coming on. Um, but I, I can just briefly say it's been a pleasure to work together with all these people, um, uh, including Sam, Sam Brankman, of course, uh, your brother Ken, um, to explore the beauty of salmon uh, on the Olympic Peninsula. And I'll deliberately say the beauty of salmon because it is an experience to be in the water with them. And I've been uh, quite stunned uh, this year to be in pools where I was actually not just putting down cameras, but actually snorkeling in them, uh, you know, with weights and breath holding in the deeper pools. And I've come upon some Chinook that I would literally consider porpoise size. Um, and when you see that kind of Chinook life next to you, you do get the feeling of understanding, yes, that's where uh, a salmon eating orca culture really makes sense when you see that size of fish. Uh, and that really hit home with me. Um, and I can only say it's really from the experience of being in the pool really close next to them. Um, and uh, I did want to add a word as, as uh, having a PhD uh, in marine mammals, both seals and uh, cetaceans, um, that I am struck by the discussion about uh, seal predation, because I, I will ask for caution. I think we have to be very careful how we talk about that because I do know that the seals in our area eat more than 60 different species of fish. And I do know that when they prowl the estuaries, it doesn't necessarily mean that they eat the smolt. They very often actually eat the predatory fish that eat the smolt. 
And that really has to come into the discussion to have an educated sense about, you know, how much is their predation and how much is their benefit uh, for small survival. Um, and I would like to see that discussion being furthered a lot more than just arbitrarily talking about removing without looking into details about, about the whole life cycle and what they do on the full scale. Um, and that's kind of something I'd like to add to that. Uh, I've seen plenty of um, diving myself in river areas when you actually see the smolt coming out. When they first hit that saltwater bore, they actually sit in the water almost traumatized, their body adjusting to different osmoregula uh, osmoregulatory mechanisms. And it's almost like they're sitting drunk in the water for a couple of minutes. It varies in time. And I've seen a lot of predatory fish sitting there exploiting that and nailing the smolt. And I've seen the seals taking those predatory fish. So um, that is really a discussion that should come to the table when we're talking about uh, whether it is even sensible to talk about a steel cow. Right, good, good point. Um, and, you know, and the increase in transient uh, bigs orcas also, um, they have to be making, when you look at um, just our ORCA data for the, the huge increase in transient presence um, in the Salish Sea and the increase in their population. Um, and they are all nice and fat because they're eating a lot of the seals and sea lions as well, as well as porpoise. Um, and, you know, so that's got to be having some kind of an impact as well. So, you know, that is a good point. We need to look at all um, you know, everything is connected in, in many ways, and it's not always easy to, um, to see everything and um, always good to just kind of make sure we're considering every factor in that. Let's put all the facts on the table and, and actually let's have a really critical look at how good our science is. I mean, if I see that a, that a, a, a trout with a, with a sensor in it doesn't swim like a trout anymore, it doesn't necessarily mean the seal has eaten it. It could also be something else that's eaten it. Um, and we need to be really smart um, and put all the facts on the table uh, before we make detrimental decisions that got us to the Marine Mammal Protection Act at the first place, because I want to uh, re uh, remind everyone that we actually cult seals and we reduce the populations that are just now coming back to the place where they've been before white folks arrived. And, and that's an important thing to keep in mind as well. Right. Well, and we, we thank you for, for all you do for all the species um, in the Salish Sea and uh, in, in the waters of the Elwha um, that the salmon and the orca footage is just so incredible. And the, the prey sharing <clears throat> footage from the Center for Whale Research, you know, it's um, researchers and uh, professional drone operators and videographies who can show us things that we normally won't get to see under, under the ocean or in the streams. And we really appreciate um, you being part of tonight. And um, I, I know we are running over time and I just want to thank everyone, especially all of the presenters who, who have given up their evening and um, all of you who stayed with us through um, our, our um, glitches <laughs> earlier and came back. Um, it's been a wonderful workshop. Um, thank you to our staff and Cindy and Katie, Stephanie had to leave, um, many others who are, are working in the background to make all of our educational um, events and our outreach and actually our, our glitch helped you see a, a little preview <laughs> of some of the outreach that was happening earlier today with Katie and Cindy uh, doing an ORCA talk um, for the Port Townsend Marine Science Center. Um, so we do all sorts of education programs um, in schools and communities. 
um, via Zoom. Um, they usually go much smoother than it did tonight. Um, and our, our sighting network that I mentioned earlier is very critical in providing the ORCA data in the presence um, and absence um, statistics of Southern residents and transients. Um, our Marine Mammal Stranding Network uh, collects information through stranded porpoise that is directly um, applicable to Southern resident orcas as well. Um, some of the emerging fungal diseases that we have found in porpoise are ones that are also harming the orcas. Um, and of course, our Langley Whale Center on South Woodby Island um, is full of information, great volunteers and staff there to meet you. So we, we encourage you to um, take part and learn more about all our programs. And I want to do a little, a little teaser about the coming month is going to be our 20th birthday, and we're going to be having some great events coming up for that. So stay tuned and visit our website and our Facebook pages. And please, if you are able to donate, um, we always appreciate your support. Much of the support we get is from people who, uh, people like you who are interested and wanna tune in to our events. We try to keep them free of charge or reasonable or by donation. So uh, we really appreciate all your support. And Cindy, did you want to say a few words in closing? I, I really want to thank Cindy for all the hard work she put into making this great program and putting it all together. Amen to that. Thank you. Just thanks everybody so much for coming. And I know a lot of you who are here tonight are out there doing a lot of fantastic work as well with education and advocacy and restoration work. So uh, thank you all so much for all the great work that you're doing. And uh, it's great to be partnering with you and let's just keep doing what we're doing. All right. Sounds, sounds great. Thank you all for joining us. We'll end for now and hope to see you at the next event.